trustees meeting for June 8th, 2022. I'd like to start by calling the roll for the trustees. Um, Caroline Miller. Present. Michelle Estrella. Here. Dave Kunz. Here. And John Carroll. Present. Thank you. Everyone is here. Um, and Allison, I think the next thing is for you to read the rule for the meeting. Okay, thank you, Karen. Are you all seeing that? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you for joining us this evening. In order to strike a balance between meaningful engagement and online security, the following rules will be applied to this meeting. This meeting has been called to conduct the business of the City of Boulder. Activities that disrupt, delay, or interfere with the meeting are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions may be limited, and no person shall speak except when recognized by the person presiding, and no person shall speak for longer than the time allotted. Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using that person's real name. So if you've joined by an iPad or anything else this evening, if you can rename yourself before you are asked to unmute or you can chat to me and I can rename you. No video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers and presenters. All others will participate by voice only. The person presiding this meeting shall enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates any rule. The chat function will be enabled to come to me only, and it's only for Zoom-related questions, no content questions, please. Only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screens during this meeting. And when we get to uh, opportunities for public comment later in the meeting, you, if you haven't signed up in advance to speak, you can have the opportunity to raise your hand by clicking on the participants icon, usually along the bottom of your screen, and then going to the three little dots in the bottom of that box to, to find the raise hand, or sometimes in the reactions icon, people are able to raise their hands. And that's it. Thank you, Allison. Um, are we letting people sign up by typing in the chat as well or not? I take it. Yeah, I'll take it. Okay. If, so if they, yeah, to me uh, in the chat. Thanks. There have been some questions about how to sign up. So for those of you who have not already signed up for the meeting and would like to speak, please uh, make a note in the, in the chat. Um, by clicking on the chat box at the bottom, giving your name and telling what item or items you would like to speak about. Okay, um, next is the approval of the minutes for the May 11th meeting. Uh, and I'd like to go through the minutes and see if there are any suggestions for revision first. Yeah. On the first page of the minutes for May 11th, um, are there any suggestions for revision? I don't have any. Okay. Um, on the second page of the minutes for May 11th. Are there any suggestions for revision? I have one item at the end of the second paragraph on page two. Um, the sentence begins, the board requested. And um, I believe it should say the use of dashboards for seeing metrics at a glance. And then, for example, the percentage of completed work compared to the total amount of work required to complete various master plan projects. Okay. 
Are there any other suggestions for revision? Okay, would someone like to make a motion to approve the minutes as amended? I so move. Second? A second. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Oh, I guess aye. I need to do a roll call, don't I, Leah? <laughs> okay, Caroline? Yes. Uh, Michelle? Yes. Dave? Aye. And John? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So it's unanimous to approve the minutes as amended. Um, with that, I'm going to turn to uh, John Potter for the Tim Hogan Declaration. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, and, uh, Dan Burke is out of town this week for Family Matters, so he asked me to fill in for him at this meeting. And our first item tonight is a joint staff and board effort to recognize and appreciate Tim Hogan, a renowned CU botanist who has worked closely with OSMP over the years. Uh, you will see a wonderful write-up about Tim in the meeting packet that reflects the high regard that OSMP staff and the community have for Tim and all his contributions to the city's open space system. I wanna thank staff and Lynn Riedel in particular for working with Vice Chair Dave Kuntz to put together a very nice tribute tonight. And I very much wanna thank Tim on behalf of the department for helping us all recognize and value the great biodiversity of the Boulder Mountain Park. We will follow uh, Dave's presentation with an opportunity to hear from anyone who would like to speak in recognition of Tim during the public comment period. And with that, I would like to hand things over to Dave. Thank you, John. Um, I wanna run uh, quickly through what I'd like to have uh, this item uh, do. I will introduce Tim while pictures of Tim in the Boulder Mountain Park, Boulder Open Space, and other mountain ranges of Colorado where he worked are shown. Then Tim will read a passage he wrote on the sanctity of wild nature. Following Tim's reading, I will ask if any other open space staff and board members would like to add their thoughts and reflections. Then I will read the declaration of the Open Space Board of Trustees recognizing the contributions Tim has made to the knowledge of the biological richness of Colorado and to the science of conservation biology. After the reading of the board's declaration, we will close the tribute for Tim with an opportunity for friends and colleagues to contribute their thoughts and appreciation be sure to let us know if you would like to comment. And uh, actually, Allison will call on you from the list of names that we have. So if that sounds like a plan, that's what we'll do tonight in recognition of Tim. Uh, Leah, oh, if you're... So tonight we're going to celebrate Tim Hogan. His unflinching dedication and commitment to protecting the natural environment, especially Colorado's front range, and to the many contributions to our knowledge and understanding of the rare and special places that define this place that we call home. Tim arrived in Boulder 50 years ago and was immediately smitten, like many of us, by the majesty of the mountains you could practically reach out and touch. Among the many idiosyncrasies Boulder was known for at the time was the beauty of the mountain backdrop, which the community had protected as a Boulder mountain park for more than 70 years. The newly minted open space program was in its infancy, having been approved by a vote of the citizens five years before, but already gaining national attention as the first community in the country to tax itself to fund a local land protection program. I first met Tim in the late 1980s when he was doing his initial floristic inventory of the Boulder Mountain Park. The Colorado Tallgrass Prairie State Natural Area on open space land had just recently been designated and Tim thought that the Boulder Mountain Park more than qualified as a state natural area. We spent the day tromping around the mountain park where Tim showed me a number of rare plant sites and several high quality native plant communities including a Danthonia perii or Perry's oak grass meadow that still to this day exhibits all of its natural and native glory. 
Although it took a while to accomplish, we never lost sight of the need to recognize and protect these special places that define Boulder. Over the years, Tim became an eloquent spokesperson for the values that make Boulder a great place to live. Words on the importance of natural areas to local communities and the world. Tim walked and worked where eminent botanists, Alice Eastwood, Francis Ramele, Ruth Ashton Nelson, Bill Weber, laid the scientific foundation for those coming after. Tim embodied what was natural and wild. He wielded a prophet's voice and a patriot's passion for wildness in the natural world. Now Tim will read a passage uh, he wrote on the sanctity of wild nature. Thank you for being here. Um, I first made landfall in Boulder on July 4th, 1972. A day or two later, I walked the Mesa Trail for the first time. The view of the flat irons and the singular aroma of ponderosa pine in the summer heat cast my life into a new direction. First as a long hair, then through formative years as a climber, and finally as a student of nature's nature. I have been nourished by the public lands of Boulder ever since. I would like to suggest we begin to review these lands as a commons, not the commons of tragedy on which individuals pursue their own particular ends, but rather a commons of sharing and cooperation upon which the citizenry has come to an agreement as to what is best for the plant and animal communities that flourish here. And for those of us who are fortunate enough to share it with the more than human world, this can become the context in which we restore and begin to make reparation with these lands and with each other. In the end, we need the solace and calm of wild nature to be whole, to be held by the gaze of a wild animal, to be nourished by a quiet trail. And the beauty, beauty most of all, is, is its essential. I am grateful to to all of you for coming. And uh, this means so much to me. And I really, really hope that we can do something about it. Thank you, Tim. Your words have special meaning for all of us at this time. And we are grateful for the opportunity to thank you for all that you have done for the past many years. Thanks, Dr. I, I know that several Open Space staff and Open Space board members would like to express their appreciation and so this is the time if anyone would like to say something about Tim. I'd be happy to start. Um, I, as, um, as far as I know, the city has never had a poet laureate, but for um, those of you who have read his eloquent and moving op-ed pieces in the camera that, uh, that Tim has written. You know that Tim Hogan is our op-ed laureate for the open space system. And for that, Tim, I wanna thank you as well as all your scientific contributions. Thank you, Karen. Uh, would others like to comment as well? Megan, I think uh, you wanted to say something. Yeah, okay, here we go. So Lynn can, can follow up on anything I, I say. So my name is Megan Bowes, and for those who don't know me, I'm a plant ecologist with OSMP. I have had the utmost pleasure with working with Tim um, for two decades. I'm gonna try not to cry here. <laughs> I just want to take a quick minute or two to express my appreciation for all the, the assistance Tim has given us. Um, Chris Wander and I have gone out with him on countless occasions to try and look for a rare orchid, um, which we haven't been able to find. It's probably extirpated, but you know, we tried our best to find it. And if anyone was going to find it, it was going to be Tim. Um, and um, I also want to 
Raz, you, um, Dave, in that, you know, we we coerced you into funding um, Tim's um, research, <laughs> the, the the random survey um, meandering search method, and uh, what what culminated from that was his amazing. Um, um, impressive mountain park and floristic inventory, which was just an update of everything he did in the late 80s and, and the 90s. And so I, I'm really impressed with, with what happened with that. So that was, you know, where Tim worked in Long and Panther Canyons, Associated Greenian Springs, which is really special, um, Dowdy Draw, Eldorado Springs, Flatirons, and all the associated areas. So, I mean, Tim definitely spanned our area. And it did an amazing job. And when it, what's most important for me personally is just, I'm, I'm sorry, the amount of time that Tim gave me personally as an undergrad student and throughout my career, just coaching me to be a botanist because he is such an amazing botanist. And, um, I am grateful for that too. And I thank you so much. And I still want to get out and take a look at those wheat grasses that, that you have a hard time distinguishing. And I will teach you, I will teach you the, the characteristics that Am Armstrong taught me 20 years ago. Um, so don't be a stranger. We'll get back out there. But thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Megan. Those were heartfelt words and I, I think are widely shared. So thank, thanks very much. Uh, now I will read the declaration of the Open Space Board of Trustees on June 8, 2022, recognizing the contributions Tim has made to the knowledge of the biological richness of Colorado and to the science of conservation biology. The Open Space Board of Trustees joins the staff of the City of Boulder Open Space and Mountain Parks Department in recognizing Tim Hogan's contributions to knowledge of the Open Space and Mountain Parks exceptional biological diversity and to local and global conservation planning and protection. We appreciate Tim's decades of documentation of Open Space and Mountain Parks botanical richness and conservation recommendations, assisting the department in carrying out its city charter purposes for open space. Tim shared his knowledge and his time to ensure that we fully understood the spirit and significance of these treasured natural places. We congratulate Tim on his retirement from the University of Colorado Herbarium after three decades of service, studying and documenting local and statewide botanical diversity. Again, Tim, thank you very much. Thank you to everybody, thank you. Uh, Dave, did you see that Lynn Riedel has her hand up? I did not, but uh, Lynn, uh, you are certainly welcome to say a few words. Thank you so much. Um, I, yeah, didn't get my hand waving in time, I think. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to add my thanks to you, Tim, um, for all your botanical studies. Uh, Megan put it so beautifully. In, um, in the Boulder Mountain Park State Natural Area over the last several decades, your inventories and publications, they have long provided us, OSMP staff and the public with a key part of the knowledge base we need to manage and protect these exceptional biologically rich, this exceptional biologically rich area for the long term. We just so, so appreciate all that you've done for us in, in that way, for the community. And Tim, um, I'm remembering um, the botany classes we went through together at CU so many years ago. And uh, we, we both followed our love of plants and natural area conservation in our careers, as it turned out, but with different um, and converging paths. And um, I'm grateful for the path that you took. I am so glad to have been involved also with this tribute. And um, here's wishing you a good retirement. Uh, and I know that that includes some of the things you absolutely love to do, hiking and botanizing in the foothills nearby here and continuing to work at the CU Herbarium. So thank you so much, Tim. Thank you, thank you.
Thank you, Lynn, for those thoughts. And, and thank you also, as John uh, mentioned earlier, for uh, really working so hard and faithfully to uh, bring this together. It's a, a very important thing, and we appreciate everything that you did. And so now we're going to welcome others who may want to share their thoughts and reflections as a tribute to Tim to do so as part of the public comment portion of our agenda tonight. And Allison will uh, let folks know when it's ready for them to talk. Uh, so Allison, if you want to jump in, that would be great. Yep. Karen and or Dave, are they getting three minutes? Do you want me to set the timer for three minutes or two for this? Uh, why don't we do two minutes? Okay. Um, so first up, we have Mike Figs. Sorry, there's a lot of people on tonight, so it'll just take me a second um, to find you all. Tim, that just shows how great you are and how many people are appreciative of your work. Yeah. <laughs> and for members of the public, we... Thanks. <laughs> We do have to keep the videos off just for oh. online security reasons, unfortunately. But you, Mike, you should be unmuted now, and I'll go ahead and state your name, and I'll set, start your timer. OK. Yep, you're good. Oh, all right. I'm Mike Figgs, I uh, live up in Allen's Park. I was a member of the Open Space Board of Trustees from 1986 to 1990, chaired the board in 1990, and was very active with the program through uh, the 1990s, worked with Ruth Wright and to negotiate with the city manager on the merger about open space and mountain parks. With me is my wife, Nan Wetterer, who worked with Tim for 15 years at the herbarium as well. And the time that I was involved with the program, Tim was always there for the program and to support it, not only with science, but also on the political end of things. We had uh, sales taxes to get taken care of. We had um, accelerated acquisition and we had a critical need to raise the bar on resource management at that time. Tim was always there, always supportive, always helping, always had a lot of common sense, was not scared of the difficult issues. <laughs> so as a member of the public, his participation was uh, critical and helped make the program what it is today. Man, do you have anything you'd like to say? Uh, well, if I may, I would just like to add my appreciation for Tim for his unceasing and eloquent work on behalf of nature, which being privileged to work with him for 15 years at the herbarium, I uh, had a good close-up look at. So thank you, Tim. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, ma'am. I love you guys. Yeah, you too. OK, uh, next up we have Raymond Bridge. Raymond, you should be able to unmute. Good evening, trustees. I'm Raymond Bridge, a Boulder resident, speaking on behalf of the Boulder County Audubon Society. Boulder County Audubon enthusiastically joins the board in recognizing Tim Hogan for his scientific contributions and his long and thoughtful advocacy for preservation of Boulder's mountain parks and open space system. In addition to conducting and publishing his outstanding floristic survey of the Boulder mountain parks, and of other unique Colorado flora. Tim was responsible for the superb herbarium at the University of Colorado. At many junctures in OSMP history, Tim has provided valuable and wise commentary and advice for the Boulder community on management of our open space lands. The Boulder County Audubon Society enthusiastically joins the board in honoring Tim Hogan. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. OK, next we have Richard Harris. And then up after Richard will be Andrew Schelling. Richard, you should be able to unmute now. Ready? Yep. You're good. 
So I'm Dick Harris, 2645 Briarwood in Boulder, and I'm speaking on behalf of Plan Boulder County. So I like to say that occasionally I yell down the hall to my wife, Catherine, who is still eating breakfast. Hey, sweetie, there's a letter to the editor by Tim Hogan. Don't miss it. The, what we may hear today is mostly about Tim's work on behalf of the environment, but I wanna comment on his writing. It exudes his passion while conveying his factual concerns. What he writes is poetry in the guise of prose. We feel inspired. It's like reading world famous writer, Annie Dillard. There's a lot of remarkable things about Tim, but one of the rarest is his ability to, sh to, share, to share effectively in writing. The best way to explain is through Tim's words, some of whom, which he has already said, but I picked it from his recent article in Ecological Citizen. He says, I would like to suggest to my neighbors, and we are not all neighbors, question mark, that we begin to view these lands as a commons, not the commons of tragedy on which individuals pursue their singular ends, but rather a multi-species commons of sharing and cooperation, a bestowal upon which the citizenry as a whole has come to an agreement as to what is best for the plants and animal communities that flourish here. And for those of us who are fortunate enough to share it with the, this more than human world. This can become the context in which we restore and begin to make reparation with these lands and with each other. In the end, we need the solace and calm of wild nature to be whole, to be held by the gaze of a wild animal, to be nourished by a quiet trail and beauty. Beauty most of all is essential. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Okay, Andrew Schelling. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I I think I muted you. Okay, try to unmute. Okay, can you unmute now? Okay, I think. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Sorry yeah. about that. Okay. Thanks. Well, first of all, Tim, thanks for being a pal all these years. That's been uh, really important. Um, I'm Andrew Schelling, and I teach over at Naropa University, and I'm a poet. And I think um, Tim looked me up 25 or 30 years ago uh, when a, a friend we both have and admired elder Gary Snyder told him, there's a poet in Boulder that you ought to look into. And Tim gave me a call and we became quick friends over coffee. And we were just hiking on Thursday and I tried to calculate how many miles we may have logged on foot together. Most of it in the Boulder mountains, you know, open space, mountain park system, but also Indian peaks, also Rocky Mountain National Park. Wildly conservative, I'd say we probably walked 3,000 miles together over the last 25 or 30 years. And um, as a poet, I have many muses, but Tim is certainly my muse of the outdoors in many ways, and particularly for botany. And I loved what you said, Tim, in your um, statement that you uh, study nature's nature. And one of the things is about that is that we're all part of nature too. So Tim and I, and all those miles we've rambled have talked about anthropology, poetry, literature, um, languages, just about everything. And uh, Karen, you know, I don't know if there's ever been a poet laureate of um, Boulder. It shouldn't be me, but if you look at my books of poetry and prose and translations over the years, you'll find a great many of them. I thank Tim for his inspiration and for his close reading of my work and for um, simply having inspired a great many of my poems. And I've worked out essays on the trail in conversation with him. So once again, Tim, just such a pal and such a great traveler on the trail together. Many, many thanks, and I love you. Thanks, Andrew. I Thank love you, you Andrew. Dave, that's all we had for signups in advance, and I know Aaron uh, would like to say something too. Okay. Hey, thanks. Um, so my colleague, Dina Clark, and I, um, 
wrote a, a short, <laughs> as short as could be synopsis of um, celebrating Tim. And we just wanted to share that with you all. And if I run out of time, I run out of time. It's about a page in length. But this is the document we shared with um, Open Space and Mountain Parks. Um, so Tim, amongst the most celebrated Colorado botanists of all time, Tim devoted over three decades managing expertly the, the University of Colorado Museum of Natural History, the Colorado Herbarium, before eventually retiring, um, counted among his many contributions as an immeasurable role that Tim played in educating so many students and the public about the importance of botanical and other biodiversity collections. Um, Tim's intimate knowledge of biodiversity and conservation derives first and foremost from his decades of floristic research conducted throughout Colorado. That ranges, of course, from the backcountry of Eagle's Nest wilderness to the rugged terrain comprising the Sangres and his most formative experiences, of course, being right here uh, in a place near and dear to his heart, the open space and mountain parks of Boulder. That work began in the early 90s, um, continued for a subsequent 30 years, and the remarkable botanical discoveries, rediscoveries, range extensions, and other contributions um, would really seem to satisfy any external observer, but the story goes on. Tim's most recent research resurveying the mountain parks of Boulder allowed him to document change over nearly 30 years on an impossibly uh, special stretch of urban open space unmatched really by nearly any other in the United States. And this kind of work sets the tone for understanding change through time. It also empowers numerous consumers ranging from the public to land managers to local scientists um, to enjoy, respect, appreciate, and conserve the, the beauty of botanical life that surrounds us. Um, but Tim's, Tim's scientific contributions, as many of you have alluded to, um, they go on and on. Um, Tim's devoted even more time to advocacy for biodiversity and wildlands um, that support this biodiversity. And for most of his adult life, um, Tim has been a passionate spokesperson for all things conservation. He's written hundreds, maybe thousands of letters to newspaper columnists, magazine editors, city council members, state senators, and beyond. He's written letters to groups, organizations, leaders, that many of us have never heard of. Um, and Tim knew all along that if he reaches a single person, then, then he had a successful uh, mission. So he made it a personal mission to remind the public about the fragility of public lands. His fight to preserve the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge took him to the halls of Congress and to the refuge itself. He's been an ardent supporter of wilderness and the need for wild places. And to this end, he served on numerous committees and organizational task forces um, assigned to uh, with preserving open spaces and wildlife cor corridors. And if Dr. Seuss's Lorax were a living person, it would certainly be Tim Hogan, his steadfast support of local and larger scale ecological conservation in and around Boulder have been amongst the most admirable and noble acts of our times. And having this Open Space Board of Trustees um, resolution honoring Tim's career and his contributions seem the most fitting uh, for, for honoring his work through time. So I just want to thank the Open Space um, Board of Trustees for, for doing so. Thanks to Tim as well. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks to everyone as well. I have uh, one, one final comment uh, from a person that could not be here tonight, but who is a close friend of, of Tim's and an eminent uh, naturalist that lives in Boulder from Steve Jones. During the late 1980s, Tim Hogan initiated a thorough floristic inventory of the Boulder Mountain Park. At the time, I had been working on breeding bird and raptors surveys for the department so we collaborated off and on going out in the frigid, in the, in the field together on several occasions. From Tim, I learned much of what I know about plants, not just the names of the rare ones, such as Malaxis monophyllos and Aurelia racemosa, but the enchanted environment where they still grow. I became intimately acquainted with places like Greenland Springs, Panther Canyon, and the isolated aspen groves on the east slopes of Bear Peak. These rare and beautiful plant communities, many of them remnants of the late Cretaceous period, have become among my favorite places on earth. And whenever I visit them to carry out bird or butterfly surveys, I think of Tim. After completing that study, Tim carried out additional studies for Boulder open space and mountain parks, along with long-term floristic inventories in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains and elsewhere. And he became Boulder's strongest advocate for preservation of remaining wild plant communities. 
Because of his work and his passion, most of these areas are fully protected within our local parks and open space system. And most of the rare plants documented by Tim during that first survey still thrive in the Boulder Mountain Park. Thanks, Tim, for all you've given us and all you've shown us over the years. It's been a blessing to work with you and learn from you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. And if, even if you can't hear me. So with that, uh, I think we conclude the recognition. And uh, again, Tim, uh, thanks from the bottom of all of our hearts for all the work that you've done. It's, it's been special and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Standing ovation. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Uh, Allison, Allison, I assume we're at the end of your list, right? For, yep, for and then we have the pu a, a lot more for general public comment. Okay, is there any way that you can uh, identify the topic about which those people want to speak or not? No. Okay, what I would like to do next um, is ask if there are any people signed up for open com public comment um, who want to speak on a topic other than the South Boulder Creek flood mitigation proje project. Mm -hmm. And other than the CIP budget as well, right? Because that has its Thank own. Thank you. Yes, and other than the CIP budget. Lynn Siegel, I can see your hand. Uh, is there anyone else? Okay, um, Allison, can you start the clock? And uh, Lynn? you'll have three minutes to speak on something other than the CIP and other than South Boulder Creek flood mitigation. Yes, this is about CU South, not the CU South um, flood mitigation aspect of CU South. The Open Space Board of Trustees needs to do everything they can to stop the further expansion of CU. Um, to cap enrollment, to actually decrease enrollment, as I mentioned the other day, not just cap it, the university is overtaking this town. The reason the Open Space Board of Trustees needs to be concerned about this is the demand for open space under a deficit of $300 million or something that we have no means for funds for. Instead, for our library district, we have to go to, to a special ballot measure because we don't have enough sales tax revenue. We don't have, there's not enough money in the pot to preserve Tim Hogan's work on the open space and putting forth CU South and the, and the Open Space Board of Trustees needs to make some active proclamation that CU is a direct threat to open space. There needs to be something strongly brought forth to the public and to, to CU and constraints, direct constraints on CU too much of a good thing. This needs to stop now and we need to think really carefully, you know, and, I, and this, is, this is at risk of stating the obvious. I know that you all know this, okay? But I have to say something because I have to, you know? I, you're representing me and you have to know that these are my feelings because you are representing me. And that is really what needs to be done strong, decisive, stringent action on CU. I love CU. My dad went to see you. My brother went to see you. My kid went to see you. I went to Seattle University, but I was in a different place. I love it, but it's only so, so much that I love of it. And I'm not gonna tell CU where they should go, that's their business. I'm not going to say, oh, go to North, you know, oh, go to a different campus. No, that's up to them. But I'm going to say that in this town, their impact is far too much on our open space and in the population that they will bring here. And, you know, if you've noticed in the East, East Business Park, it's been 
built up like crazy. It, people are, are, it's like a feeding frenzy for health sciences. Now I'm in the healthcare industry. I'm an ultrasound technologist. I appreciate that, but not that much. Stop, see you now, done. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so that we can move the agenda along, I'm going to pause the public comment period at this point and resume it after the staff presentation under Roman numeral 5A, after the staff presentation about South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project. So I'm asking the rest of you who have signed up for public comment to hold your comments. Um, we're going to try to shorten the capital improvement program budget item, which is next. Uh, as much as we can, and then we'll go on to the South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project. So um, public comment is on hold for now, and uh, it's time for the board's recommendation on the 2023 capital improvement program budget. This item Karen is on the capital improvement program budget, which staff will be requesting a motion from the board. And there will be a public hearing to get feedback from the community associated with this agenda item as posted on your agenda. Lauren Kilcoyne, Sam McQueen, and Cole Moffat will be presenting and available for questions, as will Jeff Haley and Chad Brotherton if you have questions about trails investments. This is the third budget related item of five total for this year. So Lauren, do you wanna take it away or Sam who's gonna start this? Yeah, I can get us going, thank you. Thanks, and um, just to address this, we will have a quick presentation um, and we'll save some time for questions at the end. So uh, we will hopefully be able to still squeeze in within our time frame. Thank I'm gonna share my screen. All right, I think we're ready. Hello and good evening trustees. My name is Cole Moffat and together with Sam McQueen we'll be presenting tonight for the recommended 2023 open space CIP. Next slide, please. So this is the third touch of the CIP budget for discussion and recommendation before open spaces meetings with the executive budget team in late June. We will move forward in July's business meeting with the presentation of the operating budget. So just for a little overview tonight, we will start with the budget process update, continue into a revenue update that we received numbers from that we mentioned last meeting, uh, some follow-up from the May business meeting, including some clarifying questions, ending with some public comments and the recommendation of the 2023 Open Space CIP. So the adjustment to base was approved by council on May 17th, 2022, and it includes the capital carry over to 2022. And as a reminder, you can find the specific details of this in the April OSBT packet. So budget uh, guidelines are received from finance department every year. As you know, they might be subject to change such as we receive different revenue projections. And just to let you know, the fund financial um, will, will be included in next month's packet. And so the city also used a new software process for submitting department budgets to improve uh, efficiency and reporting this year. And we'll also give a little update on uh, how that went for the next July business meeting as well. So next, so CIP materials and operating budget requests were presented to the city's peer review team last week. Uh, the PRT is tasked to identify potential major budget issues, citywide policy issues, opportunity for coordination or major conflicts that city leaders and city council should be aware of uh, during review and the decision-making meetings. The, rem the reminder that CIP projects and operating budget requests are reviewed and selected by staff for recommendation based on their connection to department priorities, plan commitments, uh, different scalings and phasings, and overall staff capacity to implement those projects. Through these meetings, we're hearing that we're consistent with the city manager's budget message and how the city manager wants to develop and implement plans. Next slide. 
and to throw it over to Sam, she'll give you an update on the revenue. Thanks, Cole. Um, so we mentioned at the last meeting that a revenue update would be available in time for this presentation. The finance department contracts with the CU Business Research Division to develop six-year sales and use tax revenue projections, which are used to plan for revenues and expenses in the open space fund. We received these updated forecasts for 2022 through 2028 from the finance department and have noted that projections for this current 2023 budget planning process are improved over those provided during last year's planning process. Our 2023 revenue outlook is better than expected. To orient us to this chart, you can see here that we expected to take in 29.77 million in 2023 during the planning process last year. And this projection was recently revised to 31.58 million, providing a $1.81 million increase to the open space fund for 2023. Sales and use taxes represented 94% of the open space funds revenue from 2021, and we anticipate around that share for revenues in future years. The 2023 CIP and operating budgets were built anticipating the level of revenue increase presented in the previous slide. As we noted in the memo, we are seeing increased operating costs this year and expect the same in out years. $1.2 million of the projected revenue increase for the open space fund is programmed for operating budget requests next year, which we'll review in more detail at the July business meeting. These operating budget requests are also included in this meeting's memo. We remain confident that the CIP is funded appropriately at $7.15 million with the latest revenue projections in mind. At the May business meeting, staff asked if the OSBT had questions or needed information to prepare for CIP recommendation this month. Based on feedback from that meeting, no changes have been made to the 2023 CIP project list or funded amount since May. We do want to note that $428,000 of the $7.15 million CIP will be funded by the lottery fund. Specifically, it will go toward funding construction of the North Sky Trail. A portion of the project you see in your packet titled North Trail Study Area Implementation, North Sky Trail and Associated Restoration that's budgeted for construction of the trail is $863,000. So this 428,000 covers about half of the project's costs. We also received a request to review 2023 operating budget details to prepare for the CIP recommendation. We'll take a closer look at investments and reduction of trail maintenance backlog in the next slide, and then master plan alignment with the operating budget and increases to base budget or budget requests are addressed in this month's memo. Turning now to the master plan strategy to reduce trail maintenance backlog, the trail stewardship program invests about two and a half to $2.8 million per year in projects across the CIP and operating budgets to reduce the trail maintenance backlog. This amount represents a majority of the program's funding with any maintenance or enhancement projects reviewed and prioritized in the context of system-wide needs. Trail stewardship really focuses on maintenance projects each year, with increased revenues, the department does have the opportunity to move forward with some enhancement projects from approved plans next year. We've identified those specific enhancement projects in the recommended 2023 CIP, and they make up a smaller portion of the trail stewardship budget than those tied to reduction of the trail maintenance backlog. More information on the department's investments in this work is included in this month's memo. And closing now, does the OSBT have any clarifying questions regarding the department's recommended 2023 CIP? You're on mute, Karen. Thank you for that pre crisp, short, but to the point presentation. Um, and uh, I'd like to ask one question about the suggested motion. Uh, the numbers you just gave was 7.15 million for this 2023 CIP. Is that number to replace the 6.719 million that's in the packet? I appreciate that clarifying question. Um, so 
The numbers you see in the motion represent two different funds. The first is for the open space fund. So that's the $6.7 million number. Oh, so and the seven, so the seven was just a total of that plus the lottery fund. Money. That's exactly right. The 428,000 from the lottery fund. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other clarifying questions about this 2023 CIP? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sam, uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, revised presentation. I, I think a lot of uh, most of our questions were answered and appreciate that. I do have one question though, but it's on the operating budget. It was in the memo. It, is that something we want to talk about or is does we're going to be spending a large chunk of time at our next meeting about the operating budget. So unless it's something that you have to have addressed to be able to vote on the CIP, I'd rather hold it over till the next meeting. Uh, that sounds fine, but I do have uh, a, a suggestion for the next meeting then. And my question is, uh, is on the addition of the one FTE for the wildland fire coordinator position. Uh, I would appreciate it if, in fact, there was a more detailed presentation of the wildland fire program and how this position specifically uh, fits into that program and what the uh, coordination and cooperation is with the uh, city fire department. That's, that's great. Thank you. I think a lot of it um, <clears throat> references the well, we can start as a jumping off point if it's helpful. We can um, kind of talk through the, the joint presentation between us and the, and the fire department at the council uh, meeting back in April and kind of build from there. Like what we've, what we've been digging into now is um, taking some of those broad recommendations and trying to boil that down to what a job description looks like and um, some working understandings as we, as we kind of go through the details of the budget process. So what do you, is that is that kind of in line with what you're thinking, Dave, just to make sure we provide uh, what you're looking for? Yeah, I, I just think if we can do a brief synopsis of the wildland fire program in the department, I my main question is the relationship between this position and the, and the fire department. Um, because it strikes me that previously the open space uh, departments certainly funded, partially funded the position or more in the fire department. And so I'm just wondering how all of this is going to fit together. Okay. That's super helpful context. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Caroline. Just, yeah. Thank you. And just to add to that, um, what Dave said, if, <laughs> excuse me, if the fire department is planning on, um, adding additional staff or, or having current staff um, kind of group in and, and work with the Wildland Fire Program if, if this new position um, somehow correlates with what they're doing as well. Yeah, that, that's great. And Sam's been sitting on the peer review team um, representing open space. So I know she's she has a sense too of what, what uh, you know, funding requests and operating budget requests some other departments are putting through that might be related. So we can take some time to um, to reach out to those folks and connect with them and, and try to craft something that answers that. Good, thanks, Lauren. Sure. Um, is there an equivalent position for floods than um, to this fire, this wildlife fire coordinator? That's a great, that's a great question. <clears throat> so after the 2013 flood, the finance department housed a flood coordinator, a flood recovery coordinator position as well as admin staff who were focused on uh, the FEMA of it all. So the, making sure we had accurate um, recovery documents and uh, we we're following all the procurement procedures and getting reimbursed and all that. Um, those positions have been, we still have, we actually house one of those admin positions now because we're still actually working on the flood. Um, but I know the city has been looking at what overarching coordination would look like um, citywide for that role. So. That's some of some of that role clarity that I think all of you are are pointing at, um, where where flood support at least in the 2013 flood was housed in an internal service department. But I think citywide they're sort of updating thinking on that model, so we can at, we can at least provide here's what we know um, as we come forward next month, which I'm sure will be imperfect, but um, maybe it'll help address some of these these questions. Okay, John, do you have any clarifying questions? I do not. Thank you for the presentation. 
Okay, I, I have one question um, and it's related to the board's discussion at our last retreat um, where we wanted to have the kinds of issues that we discuss and the kinds of things that the department works on made more transparent to the public. And I really appreciate all that, that you, Sam and Moffat and Lauren have been doing with regards to the finances in that respect to make it clearer and more transparent to the board. But my question is, um, given that we're spending basically 3 million a year in maintaining existing trails and um, restoring uh, undesignated trails in the system, whether that information is being moved out to the public in the community and what strategies the department's using to make that information public, because it seems like we're spending a considerable chunk of money um, on that kind of work and that it would be very important for the public to know that. Yeah, I can. Uh, this is it maybe is a better question for Jeff Haley or Allison Eklund, but I know we've talked about um, through master plan annual reporting in that open house web map and, and other tools like that. But um, for, for more specifics, I might defer to them. And I'm not talking about in the context of the whole master plan reporting. I'm talking about as an item that appears in an article in the newspaper this week because the board is taking action on it, the staff is recommending it, and it's a quantified substantial bit of information and, and has to do with what I think the public needs to know is being done by open space staff and being approved by the trustees. Yeah, I, so this is Jeff Haley, Trails and Facilities Deputy Director. I appreciate that, Karen. And, and just to kind of follow up, um, just a reminder, we we do have a item coming before the board this fall. I believe in September, we're gonna give a more robust update on the whole trails program and the undesignated trails program. So we can certainly speak to more in depth budget, you know, outcomes and information to the board at that time. I, I think I hear what you're saying also is that we need to, show the the amount of investment and resource that is going into our system um, and make sure the community that's being conveyed clearly and consistently to the community to, to have the our residents and our visitors aware of that so i think um you know we at, as we mentioned last month we do the the open house we've been doing the online map um, we do a variety of media, uh, social media, outreach, um, all sorts of engagement with our community that we can start to tell that story more specifically about the dollars and the investment that's going in. So I think, do you I think do that's any the press point. press releases to, the, to get the message out to the public through the media? Do you say press release? Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know that. So yes, we do. Um, in fact, just recently we did uh, quite a, substantial press release just about this year's on upcoming trail projects. Um, I remember seeing that. Yeah. <clears throat> and I don't know that we specifically said, you know, the level of investment, you know, to the tune of $3 million. Um, I think that's, that's a great point and something we'll certainly note is to be more open and more detailed about that funding amount, the, the resources that we are spending. Um, but we, you know, we do have uh, what we call our field notes. Um, it goes out to about 8,000 subscribers. Um, so yeah, I think this is all great information. Um, definitely noted. Um, and just to be able to tell that, to, to make sure the, the residents and the visitors are aware of that and that level of investment. Thanks. And, and the, the last part of what you said is exactly my point. Okay. So Great. any kind of press releases or, or social media that can push that out to the public, I think would be great. Okay, thank you, Karen. Um, are we ready for a motion? I think we need to have public input first. Oh, thank you. Uh, 
if you are signed up, Allison, do you have specific people signed up for CIP public comment? Yep, up first we have Wendy Sweet, <coughs> sorry, and then on deck will be Kevin Knight. So Wendy, I did see your name, let me find you again. Okay, can you unmute Wendy? Hi, I'm Wendy Sweet. I'm the executive director of the Boulder Mountain Bike Alliance, which represents more than 1,300 members and works to build and maintain numerous multi-use trails in Boulder County, open to all visitors to open space. I wanna thank OSMP staff for all their hard work they've done so far on the North Sky Trail. I know the planning, permitting, and sorry, I was not sure what was happening on that side. Uh, and real estate acquisitions weren't easy. And I think the dedicated staff members for all the work they've done to get us to the point of finally funding this project. It's been almost eight years to the day that city council approved the North Sky Trail on June 7th, 2016. And I'm just as excited about this new multi-use trail as I was then. This trail ticks all the boxes, a trail that can be accessed from Boulder on multi-use trails and paths without needing to drive to a mountain trailhead which is great for our climate sustainability and vision zero goals. We'll offer a quality trail and recreation experience in a beautiful area that will connect to Joda Ranch, which in turn connects to Heil Valley Ranch, which connects all the way to Lyons. It's finally time to see this trail to fruition. The Boulder Mountain Bike Alliance advocated for this project and we are committed to seeing it through. Thanks to our generous generous members, supporters, and partners, BMA was able to create and fund a new staff position, bringing on our new trails program director, Mike Redder. Mike comes to BMA with 15 years of trail building experience with Boulder County. With this hire, BMA has greatly increased our trail design, build, and maintenance capacities. In conjunction with this new position, BMA just signed a memorandum of understanding with the city of Boulder that allows us to work on city projects without the need for city staff present as was required in the past. This frees up OSMP staff to allocate more of their time and resources to other projects and allows greater flexibility in scheduling our volunteer trail maintenance projects. We are standing by ready and willing and excited to help in any capacity needed. Okay, and up next is Kevin. Kevin, you should be able to unmute now. Hey everyone, <clears throat> Kevin Knight here, um, a former OSB member. I generally treat this like uh, being President Obama who maintains a really low profile, but um, tonight I thought I would chime in. And it's really funny because Wendy was just saying how um, this was eight years ago that this vote happened. And I was on the board when this happened. And I was about to say, I think it was about four years ago when we voted on this, like, oh, wow, it's been that long. Um, I just wanted to say, I'm really excited and thankful to staff and OSBT for guiding the North Sky Trail to be something that minimizes environmental impact but will have an incredibly positive community impact. I live in the neighborhood in North Boulder where this trail will start. Um, I've hiked the current trail many, many times, but the idea that it might connect to Joder and then on to the rest of our open spaces in the county is just amazing. I think one of the things in particular I'm really excited about is that as the program is ramped up to um, deal with illegal social trails, we're gonna be able to remove a lot of illegal social trails in this area, while at the same time, giving people what they really want and, and actually what we really need, which is a trail that allows people to connect to other parts in the county. It'll make people a lot safer because they don't have to be on the roads. And it'll also have a really strong climate impact. I know for myself, right now, I find I have to drive to get to a lot of places north of town and this would mean I could ride or hike or run. Um, and I really also wanna say just the, the last thing about all this is that in my part of Boulder, 
there isn't a Chautauqua park. There isn't a place that has easy access to really experience the mountains, to really experience something being away. And this will be our shot. So I'm really thankful for that. And I'm also really thankful for other organizations and people being able to volunteer to help reduce the cost so that we have a true community effort to get this done. It's not just something that happens, it's that we're encouraging people to go out and do it. And at the same time, I think it's something that would end up being a huge net benefit for people where I live. So I just wanted to say thank you very much. And I should also add, having sat through so many CIP meetings, I know it's crazy and there's all these numbers to look at and oftentimes you're like, where do all these numbers go and how are they, how are they relevant? And really this is a part of our job as OSBT that when I really looked through it, I was like, this is how, this is how the sausage gets made. This is how we get through things. And so I'm thankful that you're all on the board and taking care of that for us now. And uh, go to Christmas Pass, will sign off now. Thanks, Kevin. Anybody else, Allison? No one that signed up in advance, no one else. I don't see any hands raised, so I'm, I'm going to close the- I see Lynn Siegel. Okay. Lynn, can you unmute now? Yeah, what Kevin said is just stellar. Um, the getting, get, you know, this is, this is the whole thing. You know, we have this major inflation going on now, $5 a gallon gas, you know, and people driving and, and the people that are hit most are the ones in commuters who can't afford to live here. And, and then we're required to have, then, then all this extra bodies using up our open space. And it's not just the capital improvements fund, you know, of purchasing new open space, but the maintenance for that open space is significant. And we let it go and we basically um, just, you know, disregarded our, our important and very costly purchase, original purchase. Um, and people are doing this all over. They did it down in Telluride, I heard this week. They built an open space. They're, they're realizing that people need these open spaces. They, they crave them, especially with more and more population. And then to meet the needs of the population that you have within you, like Kevin, he can't easily get to the open space. The, we're spreading about into the East County, right? We're sprawling all over the place. The people that are coming here that crave the open space need to get there, but we do need to control the population because it doesn't matter how much we get people out on their bikes or running to get to the open space. They aren't having to commute to open space, but if there's too many of them, that's a problem too, isn't it? <laughs> you know? I mean, these are hard realities that, that you know, we have to face. Maybe some people can't have kids or they can't have as many kids um, or they can't expect to be living in these kind of places um, without paying the price. And why should there be privilege for just those who can afford it to be here and to experience the open space and then see the value of it and then be willing to put in the funds for it. So, you know, what Kevin said was really important. And, and there's a, a deeper way of even looking at what he said, and that is open space equity for everyone. And I think that the way we do that is population management. And I think Al Bartlett told us about that and we need to heed his words. Um, and I don't mean to be pedantic. I come from a family of educators, you know, but like I said earlier, I do have to say what I believe so that you understand and you can advocate on my behalf since you're my, my reps. Thanks. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn to the board members and ask uh, if someone would like to make a motion about the CIP for 2023. I would love to make the motion. Okay. 
Um, but first of all, I, I want to thank staff for such an excellent write up um, and the bigger font <laughs> for all those numbers. Um, but yeah, I, I found it to be very clear and I just appreciate all the work that you put into that to get us to this particular meeting. Okay, so I would like to move to approve and recommend that planning board and city council approve an appropriation of $6,719,972 in 2023 from the Open Space Fund CIP as outlined in this memorandum and recommend that $428,000 be appropriated from the city's lottery fund CIP in 2023. Thanks, Michelle. A second? I second. Thank you, Caroline. Is there any further discussion from any of the board members? Karen, I have a, a friendly amendment. I, I think it would be helpful, uh, going back to your question, to have a total uh, in the motion so that it's uh, the 7.15 or whatever it is would be the total uh, CIP that we're approving. So I make that as a friendly amendment to the motion. Michelle? It's friendly to add more numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good with it. I'm a finance person. I'm good with it, just as long as everybody else is. <laughs> yes, I'll accept that. Caroline? Yes. OK, and uh, the correct number to put in there, uh, Sam, is? It is. If um, someone tell me where, to, where you're wanting like the wording. How about after, after uh, lottery fund CIP? Right. For, for a total of $7,147,972 dollars overall in the 2023 CIP. Love it. Could you please say that number? Again? Seven one one four seven. Thank you. Nine seven two. In the 2023 CIP. Just add CIP. Yep. Yeah. Good. Perfect. And I think you can eliminate the parentheses. Is that okay, Dave and Michelle and Caroline? Add the dollar sign. Yes, dollar sign. Great. Shoot. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, we're gonna have a roll call vote again. Caroline? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Dave? Yes. John? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So we have unanimous approval of the motion. OK, John, would you like to introduce the next matter? Yeah, um, thank, thank you, board, for approving the CIP. Appreciate that. Uh, for this next item, we are returning to the South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project that was last on the board's agenda in December when we had a study session and some follow-up questions on groundwater. Joe Tadiucci and Brandon Coleman are here tonight from the utilities department with an update on the 30% design and next steps. Their focus tonight will be on the direct relationship between the flood project and city open space, not any sort of comprehensive project update. No decisions are being made at this meeting tonight, which is why the director and board chair did not schedule a public hearing for this item on the public meeting agenda. So I'll turn things over to Joe now to get things started and inform us about what they have been learning with regards to possible OSMP impacts from this project. 
So Joe, thank you for that, John. And can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Great. Well, good evening, Board of Trustees. I'm Joe Tadeucci. I am the Director of the Utilities Department. And as John mentioned, I'm here with our uh, project manager for the South Boulder Creek Flood Mitigation Project, Brandon Coleman. Um, Brandon was recently, uh, just wanted to mention, he was recently promoted to be the supervisor of our storm and flood engineering group, but he's, uh, he's wearing two hats and, and still the project manager for this project. Um, just quickly here, we have another utility staff member that I want to introduce. Uh, a new staff member uh, just came on camera there. Uh, this is Chris Douglas. He's uh, a new um, manager of our utilities engineering group, and he'll be he'll be listening in tonight. But wanted to make an introduction to the board, as uh, you may see Chris on utilities related items in the future. So uh, just shifting gears and, and uh, following up on what John said, we're here tonight to brief the board on the 30% design package. And um, as John mentioned, it's, it's just a briefing or an update. There's no board action being taken tonight. I know members of the community are super interested in this project and, um, and sometimes fearful that they're, they're missing a, an action item. That's, that's not happening tonight. So this is one of a number of briefings that we plan to do with the board in advance of uh, eventually a, a disposal request, which we believe will occur in 2023. And when we get to that point, that will definitely involve a public hearing and, and formal board action. So we'll have a, a scheduled slide at the end of the presentation that <clears throat> Brandon will lead. And just quickly, we'd also envision briefing the board later this year, uh, probably later in the year on the OSO property and the, the work we're doing there with consultants on the mitigation plan. And then in 2023, we would envision uh, coming back again at the 60% design level and the 90% also for just informational updates and, and a chance for Q&A with the board. And our goal in those check-ins would be to um, get the board comfortable with the project, hopefully, and how we're managing the impacts prior to a request for a, a disposal and that conversation. The last time we checked in with the board uh, was, was December 2021, where we uh, focused on the groundwater modeling work and the updates on that in progress. The board had a number of questions and, and we had a homework assignment after the meeting to follow up and, and uh, put together responses to those questions, which we sent those to the board a few weeks back, uh, separate for the, from the meeting packet, I believe that was sent for tonight. Um, the, the last thing before I turn it over to Brandon, as John mentioned, there, there's a lot to the 30% design and, and a lot of elements to this project. Our presentation tonight and the, and the focus with the open space board will be on the design elements that have open space impacts. Um, and, and just mentioning, I'm sure you saw in the memo, at this point in the design process, we're calculating 5.1 acres of, of impact. Um, I would note that that's a work in progress and we will be working with our consultants and, and project team and John and Don and the open space staff with the goal of reducing that number as we go through the remaining uh, design steps. So with that, I will turn it over to Brandon who I think has a, a handful of slides to share and, and will lead the presentation tonight. Great, thanks, Joe. Uh, good evening, board. I'm just going to share my screen here and make sure I get the right one shared. Okay, let's make sure that is there. Um, <clears throat> sorry, just one second. There we go. Okay. Um, so, good evening, board. Thanks for uh, letting us be here again tonight. Uh, as Joe mentioned, I'm Brandon Coleman. Um, now a flood uh, supervisor in the storm flood utility, but still the project manager for the South Boulder Creek uh, flood mitigation, which is what 
uh, we're here to talk about tonight. So uh, just for tonight, we started, uh, Joe gave a brief introduction about the project, kind of where we're at, what 30% design is. I'll go over the details of the 30% preliminary design, and then uh, we'll discuss a little bit of next steps after that. So really what we're here to talk about tonight is a flood mitigation project proposal um, to address South Boulder Creek flood mitigation and uh, its estimated impacts on an existing open space property. Um, the project is just finishing up the 30% design and um, we have an initial estimate of impacts on OSMP and uh, additional design details on uh, mitigation features related to the project. So just a reminder, um, I know there's a few new board or a new board member who hasn't uh, heard about the project or been presented uh, about the project as a open space board member. So the real goal of the project uh, is protecting life safety. So this is really addressing flooding from South Boulder Creek that overtops US 36 and then ultimately enters the city um, in an area commonly referred to as the West Valley. So this slide is what we saw during the conceptual design. So Joe mentioned the five acres. This is really the five acres um, that we have really been trying to work towards um, through our conceptual design. And we'll be talking about updates to this five acres. This is 90 feet off of the um, open space uh, property line along US 36. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna try and, there it goes. Okay, great. Um, Right. Okay. Um, so changes to this five acres are really focused on the area where it connects to the US 36 and adjacent to South Boulder Creek, uh, which is shown by this circle here. And the other changes at the outlet works, which is um, on the western side of the property, kind of on the CU South um, open space property boundary. So currently, uh, Joe mentioned we are estimating 5.1 acres of impacts based on the 30% design, and this includes 1.4 acres of temporary impacts and 3.7 acres of permanent impacts. And you can see from this figure that that five acres has changed, um, uh, not very much, but a little bit, and we continue to look for ways to eliminate, reduce, or mitigate impacts on open space and better define the area required for construction of the project. So the changes you will see tonight um, will be on the east side of the project along South Boulder Creek and then on the west side of the project adjacent to the CU South property. So this figure, this is uh, one of the drawings, one of the preliminary design drawings that were included in your package. Um, it was shown in figure two in the memo and it's also shown as sheet D1 in our uh, plan set. So we attached a set of selected drawings kind of to highlight the key components that could have uh, impacts to open space. So the spillway flood wall is a key feature and that's really what's driving the need for the open space property. And it actually starts in the CU South property. Um, and that's shown in this circle here. And as it moves towards the east, it crosses over the property boundary between uh, CU Boulder and open space. And those are the impacts uh, we're really focusing on. And that's in this area here. And there's a few design features that we'll be talking about that happen within this area. First is the spillway flood wall. Next is the groundwater conveyance system and also the outlet works. <laughs> So the spillway flood wall is going to be a concrete uh, spillway flood wall along US 36, and that's going to allow for us, um, that will be a permanent feature that will be visible after completion of the project. Next would be the groundwater conveyance system, which is a subsurface feature that allow for natural groundwater to pass through the spillway foundation and maintain the existing groundwater conditions adjacent to the project. And last is the outlet works, which we found through the design process that um, the proposed construction methodology would have impacts outside of those, uh, the original 90 feet. And that's why we'll be talking about the outlet works tonight. And the outlet works are really to discharge the detention facility um, during a flood and after the flood waters have receded. And it's hard to see on this slide, I got a few of these, um, but we did renderings 
Uh, this is really a bird's eye view of the flood wall. You can see it kind of in the foreground. This is US 36 looking to the north. Um, and then really what that flood wall is doing is capturing flood waters that want to go towards that West Valley area and over top US 36. This is just another vantage point from the on-ramp from foothills to US 36 eastbound. And you can see the the flood wall in the foreground and as it extends out to South Boulder Creek, which are the trees in the back there. And really this is how the project is going to function and why the flood wall is so important to the project is that it's allowing us to convey the flood waters to the main detention area on the CU South property um, and also create that detention that we need to be able to release uh, the flood waters uh, safely. So this is just uh, pointing out where the flood waters are, and that's that's uh, uh, where the flood wall is. Just so you can see it, it's it's hard to see just because we're at a very high level view, and uh, that's just wanted to point that out for everybody. And these renderings help me visualize this. So a lot of times you get a package of engineering drawings, and it's hard to visualize what the project will look like. So these actually help me place the project in real space out there and trying to visualize what's going on. So the first design element we're gonna be talking about, and that was included in the packet is the spillway flood wall. And this would really be the above ground structure. Um, that's left behind after construction is complete. And the wall was actually selected to minimize the footprint of the project, and it's going to be designed to safely pass flood flows larger than 100-year event uh, downstream because we are planning to detain waters uh, for the 100-year event. And one of the major uh, components that we really focused on and came up with some more details with uh, in this design package is really the connection to US 36. So we need this to create detention for the project because US 36 is uh, essentially the high ground out there. So to be able to detain floodwaters, we need to connect into that US 36 embankment. And we've accounted for a lot of things, uh, the wildlife crossing and the US 36 regional bike path in this tie-in location. And while doing that, we've also tried to locate this as far as feasible away from South Boulder Creek so that was really the first change in that five acres that we discussed during the concept design was we've actually moved this tie-in location back from South Boulder Creek uh, about 150 feet, which actually uh, reduces our impacts to Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse habitat and uh, keeps our facility further away from the riparian area associated with South Boulder Creek. So the next component is the groundwater collection system. And this is gonna be a subsurface feature uh, associated with the sea camp pile wall. So for our flood wall to have a firm foundation, we're proposing to install a sea camp pile wall, which would cut off groundwater. And to allow for natural groundwater to continue to move through that sea camp pile wall and feed the property upstream and downstream of the wall, we need a groundwater conveyance system. And we need to move that groundwater through our foundation in a safe manner. So this is really the next feature and you'll see on my next slide why this is so important for what is in, what the impacts are within that uh, 5.1 acres that we've mentioned. So you may have noticed on the previous sections and also in the design drawings, there's an area of excavation and we tried to summarize kind of the construction steps we think would need to happen um, to be able to construct this project and limit that to within that 90 foot uh, area that we had been working with through the conceptual design. So the first step in doing that is going to be to excavate a working platform. And this is pretty common with pipeline projects, but also it allows us to access the depth we need uh, to be able to install that groundwater conveyance system I uh, referenced previously. So the next step would be to install um, the sea camp pile wall uh, after we have that working platform. And that's a drilling operation that happens. So that's um, drilling piers that are continuous that would create a continuous foundation and also a, a groundwater cutoff um, on top of that. And then from that, we would build up our spillway flood wall on top of that sea camp pile wall. Um, and then after that's complete, 
we would plan to install the groundwater collection system. And that's really what the construction um, vehicles are shown on here. So you'll see an excavator where we'd be trenching for the groundwater collection system and with a dump truck adjacent to that. So that's how we've kind of thought through the construction um, and what's going on in that 90 feet. And then once we're done with the groundwater collection system, we would plan to backfill to the natural grade. Um, so our flood wall and our groundwater conveyance system, the Sea Camp Pile Foundation stays subsurface and you would see our flood wall on top of the surface. So we have had a lot of questions about the groundwater conveyance system and just groundwater in general in the area. As Joe mentioned, um, we did respond to questions from our December meeting in, in a written responses in the May 11th OSBT package. Um, so I just kind of want to cover some concepts around the groundwater conveyance system and what it's designed to actually do. So it's a combination of groundwater collection and distribution. So what that means is upstream. So on this figure, groundwater is moving from left to right. Um, and you'll see in the middle of the screen is our sea camp pile wall. And that's what's creating the barrier to groundwater. Um, and so the first step is really collection of that groundwater. And we need that to be able to collect the groundwater to be able to safely pass it through our foundation. So after we collect that groundwater, we would then pass it through piping that would penetrate our sea camp pile wall. And this is really a safety feature. So we don't see piping or any other uh, internal erosion uh, beneath our spillway flood wall. And then after that's conveyed across, there would be a distribution trench on the downstream side um, of the groundwater conveyance system that would allow the water to naturally infiltrate. And really this system's meant to act in balance with the natural groundwater um, out, out on the property. So the other uh, thing we we're gonna talk about related to groundwater tonight were uh, examples of similar projects of where this has been used and where it's been successful. And although we can't find an exact project where this has been used, these are very fundamental engineering concepts we're using for the groundwater. And we did find two examples that we think are relatively similar to what the project is. And they're from uh, environmental remediation projects that have happened across the country. So the first one is a uh, Marzone Chevron Superfund site and Superfund is just a term for EPA site. So it's an environmental remediation project. And this one, if you see this figure and I'll slow down and kind of walk through this figure a little bit, but on the left is a plan view and on the right is a section. So the plan view, you'll see um, the purple line and sorry, I know um, Michelle, I think is colorblind. So um, the very top line there is a collection trench and that's very similar to what we're proposing. The second line down from there would be a slurry wall. So um, not a sea camp pile wall, but a groundwater barrier. And then you'll see there's a line cutting through those two, that's the piping. So you have groundwater collection, you have piping through the barrier and then at the very bottom, you'll see a, a thicker line. That's a distribution trench. So it's collecting groundwater, conveying it through an impermeable barrier, and then distributing it to the soil. And um, that was just scrolling down here too. Um, it's not a, it's not quite as high as a flow rate, and the soils are a little bit different. But this project's been installed in since the late 90s and has been functioning, the EPA considers this a successful project. And you'll see in the section view, we have very similar features to what our system would be, which would be the, co the collection trench, the barrier, and then the distribution system, which isn't shown on the section, but further downstream. So the next project uh, we have is a Mendocino uh, forest projects, which is another environmental remediation site. And if you can see now groundwater is flowing from right to left in the plan view. So the plan view is on the left-hand side. And this is a series of collection trench, which is that first set of lines. Um, and then there's a treatment manhole since it's an environmental remediation project, which our project would not be treating groundwater. But then you have these connector pipes that penetrate a slurry wall. Um, 
that actually feed into a distribution trench. And so really that's a very, very similar system to what we're proposing. And this again was installed in the nineties. It's still functioning today and it's a passive system. Um, some of the similarities to our project is our projects proposing multiple segments to address uh, changes in the uh, groundwater flow. So um, cutting off segments and actually trying to capture groundwater where it's actually flowing. Um, there's a slurry wall, which is penetrated into bedrock. So our sea camp pile wall would actually be penetrated into bedrock, which would create uh, that cutoff, very similar to the slurry wall. And then uh, the disruption to the groundwater. So having that slurry wall and actually collecting the groundwater, passing it through, through the barrier and then discharging it downstream is um, almost exactly similar to the system we're proposing. So these have been used. Um, the fundamentals are very similar. We tried to come up with projects that were as close to what we're doing um, as possible. So next, um, this is probably a new component and one we kind of found out later in the design after we had started talking about constructability. So this is the outlet works. So the project um, is proposing to discharge floodwaters after they've been detained to Vili Channel. And to do that, we would need an outlet works that goes under US 36. And we've proposed that be constructed through a combination of tunneling, which would happen under US 36, but that tunneling has limitations in length. So to get around those limitations, we've proposed an open trench actually from our first launching shaft for the tunnel, which is all on the south side of US 36 um, to where we would collect the water in our embankment. And that's where we see that additional uh, impacts to open space. And really, when we're talking about those additional impacts to open space, we're talking about 0.3 acres outside of that 90 foot width. And it's this area here. So you can see our trench moves through there. And really, as we move into 60% design, this is something we're working with OSMP staff on alternatives to this alignment and ways we could actually bring that uh, alignment back into that uh, easement. And then, as I mentioned before, I, the renderings just help place uh, some of the uh, features in space. So this is just a rendering of what the project would look like after uh, it's done. And you can see the outlet pipes there and really the, they're headed towards US 36 and that's where our tunnel would be. And lastly, um, we have made some progress. So. Um, a key component of the project is going to be this open space other area, which is a portion of the CU South property, and it's commonly referred to as the OSO property. And this was available to us through the CU South annexation, and that's really where we're focusing our mitigation efforts. Um, we're we're going to be focusing our mitigation efforts there because it is located within the historic South Boulder Creek floodplain. And it also has an existing levy on the property that if we were to remove that levy, which um, we get benefits for the flood project, but we also can reconnect the historic South Boulder Creek floodplain with removal of that levy um, and makes mitigation uh, available there. So next steps, um, I'm just gonna bring up the schedule um, we've shared this schedule at our December meeting and also at our um, city council update. We provided a presentation to city council as well. And really, as you can see, we're coming to an end at the 30% design. Um, we've provided our internal city comments to the design consultants, and we're hoping to post that full design package to the web page uh, later on this month. And then we're also scoping the work for the 60% design, which is the next phase and starting some of those items uh, currently. So that's all I have for a presentation. I wasn't sure, Joe, if, did you wanna comment on any of the schedule slide or? No, I just, just to reiterate the schedule slide and, um, and the comments I made at the beginning, this is the first of a number of briefings we would plan to do with the board to, to bring you along on our design work. And um, <clears throat> then sometime in 2023, um, when hopefully we're comfortable with it, we would we would come to the board with a disposal request. So that's that's how things are looking right now. 
Perfect. Yeah. And that's all the presentation slides I have uh, for this evening. So happy to answer questions or um, go over anything else if needed. So thank you for the time tonight. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, while we're on your schedule there, your Gantt chart, um, in our December packet, uh, it showed that the open space other restoration design was to start in quarter one of 2022. Um, I don't see that indicated here and I'm wondering, uh, it, it doesn't seem to me from the material we've been provided that that's been started. Can you tell, give me an update on the start of the open space other restoration design in quarter one of 2022? Sure. Yeah, we have started on that work and, and apologies, it's not showing up here. Um, we have started on that work. So the way we're approaching that is um, re we've brought on some sub consultants under RJH and we've done that in partnership with OSMP staff um, through the selection process, through the interview process to come up with a sub consultant that we think would be the right fit for that type of work. Um, so we've selected Westervelt and Headwaters as our subconsultant for that work. And we're currently in the background information phase of getting them information they need um, up to speed on the project. So we have started that work. Um, we have uh, made a selection and that's the team we're working with. And um, they're also doing um, some other work for open space on Lower Boulder Creek, I, I'm pretty sure. And I think open space could probably help me uh, with that, so. John, did you want to add anything? Yeah, just that um, and I think Don D'Amico is is uh, around here too and may be able to speak to this as well. But uh, we, we did hire this uh, Westerbelt firm to help us with the lower Boulder Creek design, which is is somewhat similar to the types of uh, flood floodplain reconnection that we would hope to do in the OSO as, as Brandon was referring to. Um, so we're optimistic and we're very pleased with their work on the lower Boulder Creek and are optimistic that they will be a good consultant, um, good third party to work on this uh, project going into the 60% design. And that'll be coming back to OSBT approximately when? I, I think um, we will likely see something in, in the fall sometime, uh, maybe some early product from that uh, consultant and uh, we'd be happy to talk with the utility staff about coming back and sharing some of that at that, that point if it's, if it's convenient. Okay. Um, I'd like to speak with the board at this point and clarify uh, the next two steps in the meeting. Um, so can we get the faces of the board members back? I guess that means getting rid of the Gantt chart. I don't know who's in charge of the screen. Karen, are you able to make yours? Like right now, I see everyone on the side and see there them. We go. There we go. Thanks. Um, so what I'd like to find out from the board is whether you'd like to go through a series of questions with Brandon first and then um, reopen the public comment or have the public comment next and do your questions and discussion after the public comment. I'll just unmute myself and say just for, for their consideration to allow them to go first if, if they're on any time restraints. I guess, Karen, my feeling would be that we should do clarifying questions from the board prior to public comment. Okay, so I have a clarifying question. Um, just pr process wise, I, I want to be clear in my head and also in the community, I'm just gonna echo what John and Joe said earlier that um, it's, you know, we're having a public input session that is not based on any action. So I hope I'm hoping that the community members are not confused by that, by opening up um, 
a public session on uh, this particular topic when there's not an action. No, um, the, normally they would provide that in the, the beginning of the meeting. That's correct, Michelle. There's no action for this item on the agenda. And I, as chair, I chose to uh, break the public comment into two parts so that we could move on with the agenda, finish the CIP, and then move on to this agenda item. Um, John, do you have any preference about the sequence? Um, uh, would we get a chance to ask clarifying questions after the public uh, speaks Ab regardless? Absolutely. absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think we should let the public speak first, then that's generally how we would do it on these sorts of topics. Okay, then um, I, I would agree with that view. And I'm going to ask for Allison to provide two minutes to each of the people who have signed up for public comment, either by raising their hand or by listing their names in the chat or by the sign up process. And we'll go through those people's comments, two minutes each, and then come back to the board for questions of clarification and discussion. Okay, so I have quite a list of people who signed up in advance. So I'll go down that list first before we get to raised hands. So first up, we'll have Margaret Lacombe, and then on deck will be Stephen Tallinn. Okay, Margaret, and we have you... a two minute timing, yep. uh, Gizmo? Okay. Yep. And Margaret, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Margaret, okay, yes, looks like I'm okay. okay. Thank you. So thank you. Um, Open Space Board of Trustees faces a critical decision about giving the city five acres of land in a state natural area to construct a dam and flood wall to, for flood mitigation. There are two critical questions here. One, how will the flood project affect the groundwater flows that nurture critical wetlands and open space? And what risks does the project pose, pose to the state natural area and its rare and protected habitat and species? But the project designers have not provided uh, OSBT with pertinent answers to these questions. First, the flood mitigation project has done no field studies of species and habitat per, in, in South Sea South. It is not possible to assess the environmental impact of the construction project without such inventories. Secondly, the mitigation of harm proposed by project designers involves relocating threatened species into the open space other areas at CU South, but this is within the old gravel mines degraded habitat, not the rich wet meadow habitat where these species are found. No data show that mitigation by re relocation has ever been successful, even under the most favorable conditions, despite really heroic efforts by the OSMB staff. Recreating the wetland prairie upon which these species depend, habitat that required millennia to develop has failed. Thus, there's no evidence that the proposed mitigation will be effective. Third, and most critically, this groundwater conveyance system has not been tried before. Will it still work when the system is inundated in conditions different from what those it was designed for? That is, canyons, not flatlands like the South Boulder Creek floodplain, or if the system is filled with debris and settlement, sediment during flooding or if the valves and safety features designed to be operated manually can't be operated during a flood. And most critically, will it work in perpetuity given the usual lifespan of, of, floods and, of flood walls and dams of 50 years or so? And fourth, there's no baseline data. The flood project is based upon pro projections from computer modeling <clears throat> and historical data, not field studies of current conditions. And that past data is not the best predictor for the future. OSBT is being asked to make a leap of faith, to make a data-free decision, and then hope for best case scenarios. But what if the project fails? This is not just about five acres. If it fails, all the hundreds of acres of the state natural area of, will, <clears throat> downstream of the flood wall may be destroyed and their plants, animals, and birds will disappear. 
We absolutely believe that flood mitigation is necessary. We also believe that this project is so flawed that it cannot and should not be implemented as designed. We recommend that OSP not dispose of any land unless and until the project data confirm that the entire open space area can be adequately preserved and protected. Thanks very much. Thanks, Marky. Allison, I didn't see what happened to the timer. Um, well, it goes off, it, it goes to zero for a few seconds and then it automatically restarts. So I turn it off at that point. So if it's not on, it means it's Okay. Yeah, I was Just, making a note when that happened. And okay, I, sorry. Yeah, if you don't see it, it means it's it's up. Stephen, I I saw you. Oh, there you are. You can unmute now, and on deck will be Jim McMillan. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. I'd like to thank the board for the opportunity to comment on the thirty percent design plan. Uh, the 30% design presented tonight incorporates at least four unstated assumptions that require clarification before you as public trustees make a consequential decision on giving up even a small portion of this public land. Assumption one is that every design element will work exactly as proposed from the groundwater conveyance system to the relocation of endangered species. There's been no consideration of what happens if any or all of these design elements fail partially or completely, and more importantly, specific corrective actions that can and will be taken to correct each type of failure and repair the damage. Assumption two, your land transfer decision will only affect the 5.1 acres required for the flood wall. In reality, if there is a problem, particularly with failure of the groundwater system, hundreds of acres of open space land on both sides of US 36 could be negatively affected forever. Assumption three, there's no need to include a plan for establishing baseline data followed by long-term monitoring of the actual effects and changes to the groundwater conditions, species, population densities, and distributions, or even the performance and integrity of the engineered structural elements. Four, when completed, the benefits of this project will outweigh the substantial risks, both known and potential to the environment and the land you are entrusted to protect. The design document in front of you says that the South Boulder Creek floodplain, there are 600 structures and 3,500 people. These numbers represent 1.2% of the structures and 3.2% of the people within the city of Boulder. So the question I leave with you as public trustees is, are the environmental risks to the rare and endangered habitat and species entrusted to your board worth the limited flood protection benefits for this small percentage of the people and structures? Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Okay, Jim McMillan and on deck will be Helen Burnside. Jim, you should be able to unmute now. Okay, thank you. You can hear me? Yep. Great. Well, um, thank you for your, your service to our community trustees. Um, the, I, I really echo the previous comments and, you know, where is our established baseline understanding of how this rare and, you know, hot spot wetland diversity um, wet meadow tall grass habitat functions so that we'll know if we're being successful or not. Where is the due diligence been done on the conveyance system to show that this will work in this kind of um, environment? The, I appreciate the, the city of Boulder's efforts that Brandon Coleman uh, nicely uh, brought up some examples, but those examples are environmental destruction zones <laughs> that are being remediated they are not this precious, rare, best that we have left ecosystem that is being put at danger of this incredibly foolish design. I mean, all of flood, uh, all of flood design principles in the modern era would say avoid high hazard dam construction to the great extent you can. Certainly don't bring fill in to fill up wetlands so you can develop them and reduce their ability, their ecological function as a floodplain, um, especially when they're adjacent the state natural protected area. And it, yes, it is not the five, only the five acres at risk as, as both um, the previous speakers have commented on, 
this jeopardizes potentially all a lot of the downstream area that much of it is very precious. The city of Boulder residents, you know, many of whom, like myself, moved here because of the environmental values. Um, we pay extra extra for to have these open spaces, and here we're jeopardizing so much. So hold the line, wait for facts. We need established baseline data and monitoring. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Okay, Helen Burnside, you should be able to unmute, and on deck will be Amy Simel. Thank you, board. CU's 312 acres are contiguous habitat with the Tallgrass Prairie State Natural Area and OSMP's lands in the south and east, which support the majority of the city's Mesic Tallgrass Prairie, a globally threatened plant community. Contiguous habitat preservation and acquisition are the highest ranking conservation strategies outlined in OSMP's grassland management plan, and the greatest risk to ecosystem health is incompatible surrounding land use and habitat fragmentation. Over 100 bird species have been observed here, and more than half of them are breeding. More than a dozen of these breeding birds are conservation targets in OSMP's grassland ecosystem management plan. Additionally, the CU floodplain property supports the Savannah Sparrow, American Bittern, Gray Catbird, Bobo Link, which breed here, and are species of special concern in Boulder County. The Northern Harrier might be breeding here as well, and the Osprey and Great Blue Heron hunt here, and are also species of special concern. In fact, 80% of Colorado's wildlife species depend on wetland and riparian areas at some point in their lives. In arid climates like Colorado, where evaporation often exceeds precipitation, wetlands are irreplaceable habitats for ducks, shorebirds, wading birds, cranes, and raptors that either breed or stop over during migration. There are many unanswered questions about the groundwater conveyances system impact on the state natural area, which I hope can be addressed now in the 30% design, not later. While the examples tonight showed similar technology and are so appreciated, neither were adjacent to nor contained land of ecological significance. What will happen if the project changes groundwater flows into the natural area and other wetlands? How will the backfill after construction affect groundwater? Open space value was never meant to be defined by flood mitigation. And as Tim, Tim Hogan mentioned tonight, open space is meant for the wild creatures and species that depend on it. Thank you for your time and all that you do. Thank you, Helen. Okay, Amy is up and Raymond Bridge is on deck. Amy. Okay, Amy, you should be able to unmute. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Amy Seymour and I'm speaking tonight to encourage you to uphold your charter. The South Boulder Creek Natural Area, designated only 23 years ago in 1999, contains wetlands that are considered among the best preserved and most ecologically significant in the entire Boulder Valley. This site supports native mesic tallgrass prairie and riparian plant communities in good condition, as well as the largest known population of the federally threatened Utes Ladies Trusses Orchid in all of Colorado. The area contains additional rare and imperiled plant communities, including the Western Great Plains Big Blue Stem, Prairie Cordgrass Western Wet Meadow, Woolly Sedge Wet Meadow, and the Eastern Cottonwood. The South Boulder Creek Natural Area is recognized statewide as a significant natural community. This moment right now is a crucial opportunity to protect rare biological resources for future generations. Boulder taxpayers like me have spent millions of dollars to intentionally acquire these fragile wetlands in bits and pieces over many years. How can we be sure that the engineered flood well will accurately mimic the delicate natural conditions and groundwater flows to sustain all of these unique and imperiled organisms? How can we take such an uncalculated risk with these rare and threatened areas only 23 years after designating them as places we wish to protect and preserve forever. If the flood wall is constructed, the work doesn't end there. It's only just beginning. What is the plan if the flood wall doesn't work as planned or gets clogged? 
If the conveyance system fails, the consequences are enormous and could imperil globally significant plant species. This is not just about the five acres under consideration for disposal. This is about the viability of the entire state natural area. Is this a risk we're willing to take in lieu of asking CU to be a responsible neighbor? Is monitoring the flood wall funded and part of the project in perpetuity? How will we know if there are problems? Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Raymond is up. You should be able to unmute. And on deck is Max Goldmeisel. Good evening, trustees. I'm Raymond Bridge, a Boulder resident, speaking on behalf of Boulder County Audubon Society. We would like to comment on the proposed South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project that's being presented to you tonight at the 30% design stage. Since construction of this project would require that this board initiate a disposal of just over five acres of OSMP land, OSBT has an important role to play in reviewing the project. However, the five acres that would be disposed of do not begin to encompass the actual impacts this project would have on OSNP lands. The project would affect groundwater flows that support the unique grasslands, including a habitat conservation area and the Colorado State Natural Area adjoining Boulder Creek. As the presentation makes clear, the secant wall extending down to bedrock would stop the flow of groundwater without an adequate groundwater conveyance system operating in perpetuity. Unfortunately, the proposed groundwater conveyance system is being designed based on a badly flawed groundwater model. Some of the problems with this model were pointed out to this board by Gordon McCurry, a hydrologist who was an expert on the hydrology of South Boulder Creek. I have pointed out other problems with this model based on totally inadequate ex examination of the underlying geology. We urge the board to communicate to the utilities department and to city council that the current preliminary design is unacceptable because of groundwater issues. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Okay, Max, you should be able to unmute. Yes, everyone can hear me all right? Yep. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I will actually be reading from the memorandum written by Gordon McCurry, uh, speaking on his behalf. We can't make it tonight. He is the professional hydrologist with over 35 years experience, just mentioned by Raymond. It's a good segue. Uh, Gordon sent this memorandum to Joe Tadeucci and Brandon Coleman, dated March 10th, 2020. The following comments are based on the South Boulder Creek Regional Detention Project Baseline Groundwater Modeling Report. It is Gordon's hope that in sharing these comments, the groundwater model can be improved so that it serves as a more useful tool in evaluating the the hydrolog uh, hydrologic effects of the proposed flood mitigation structures. Seven points. Point one, the report lacks sufficient detail to enable the reader to adequately evaluate whether the model inputs were developed correctly, whether they were input into the model appropriately, and whether the calibration process followed recommended guidelines. Much more detail is needed for such an important groundwater model. Two, the monthly stress period length appears to be too long to adequately represent the dynamic nature of several hydrologic inputs. A weekly or daily stress period length is needed to simulate those inputs accurately. Three, the way in which the unconsolidated deposits are simulated represents a serious limitation of the model. The alluvium is simulated to be uh, with too few hydrogeological units to accurately represent the range of hydraulic conductivity values determined from on-site testing, and there appears to have been no attempt to use borehole logs to delineate aquifer lithologies. These K values assigned to the unconsolidated units appear to be far too high for most units, and a reassessment of the input values for K is necessary. Just given the time that I have left, I think I'd just like to um, uh, go, move ahead to Gordon's last point, keeping in mind everyone else's comment. And the theme of tonight, which is to protect this land from development to repeal the CU South annexation. And Gordon's last point is, it is very disappointing that the internal reviews and external third party reviews of this model left it with so many significant issues and the report lacking in so many details. Thank you and let's improve this plan for all of us. Thank you, Max. 
I don't see Kim and Harmon unless they have joined by a different name. But if Kim and Harmon is on, uh, please raise your hand or message me in the chat. Also, somebody signed up as S Hack, which I don't see, and I don't know if that's a name. I don't see it on here tonight. So if either of those two names are present, raise your hand or message me in the chat. Otherwise, we'll continue down the list. Allison Burchell is up. Allison, you should be able to unmute now. Actually, I, uh, Allison, uh, yes. I wasn't planning on talking tonight. I was planning on writing a memo. Thank oh. you. OK, thanks. Yeah. Mary Scott. Let me find you here. Okay, Mary, you can unmute. Thanks, Allison. <clears throat> Uh, I thought we had three minutes, so I will go through my points pretty swiftly. My name is Mary Scott. I've been in Boulder for 20 years practicing as a family nurse practitioner, and I live at 2820 Table Mesa Drive. I'd like to share my thoughts with you regarding the exciting new City of Boulder campaign that launched in April named Cool Boulder and its relationship to CU South. As you know, collaborations across many city departments and local organizations has already begun, and it gives me hope that our community will take a deeper and broader dive into solutions to global warming. I'm a member of PRAB, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, and I'm looking forward to our joint board meeting on June 23rd to brainstorm what can be done to support this inspiring Cool Boulder initiative. I urge you to consider the profound degradation of this precious habitat that will occur within our beloved city if the space at CU South is built upon. Paving over a tall grass prairie and the large water aquifer that exists underneath this magnificent 308 acres would be devastating for the open space that makes Boulder the place we all cherish. It would not be in line with the Cool Boulder campaign, which I paraphrase here. Cool Boulder is a long-term campaign to create partnerships to implementing nature-based climate solutions. The effort to protect and regenerate urban ecosystems, soils, trees, and habitats will increase the natural world's ability to absorb carbon, heat, and water, making our community cooler, healthier, and better able to withstand hotter and more volatile climate fluctuations. The building of a CU South campus would be entirely out of line with the Cool Boulder campaign, campaign. Please let us build unity and equity in our city and not tear it down. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay, Peter Mayer is up next. Peter, you can unmute and on deck will be Joy Barrett. I can hear me. Yes. Thank you. Tonight, you were asked to consider the 30% design for a highly controversial and frankly uncertain flood mitigation project that raises more questions than it answers. But for a questionable and potentially illegal emergency ordinance approved by city council, your work would be on hold right now until after November 8th and the pending referendum vote. That referendum vote will occur and Boulder citizens may well choose to put a cold stop to this plan. Great uncertainty hangs over every aspect of this project. For starters, open space land was never intended to be developed for flood infrastructure, such as the plan in front of you. One fundamental purpose of op the open space program has been to purchase land and protect land in floodplains and to ensure that they are not developed. Protecting floodplains is far and away the best way and most preferred way to mitigate floods. The design under consideration tonight includes an untested and unproven groundwater conveyance system, which the city's own consultant and staff admits a certain unfamiliarity. The system relies not only on proper design and construction, but also on meticulous ongoing maintenance. The city of Boulder will be responsible for this maintenance. And given the state of maintenance of our current flood facilities, such as Beely Channel and Two Mile Creek, as well as other critical conveyance, we must question if the city is prepared and capable of this task. 
I urge you to closely consider the extensive and detailed comments of Dr. Gordon McCurry, who is the single most knowledgeable scientist and water practitioner with regard to South Boulder Creek floodplain. There is simply no one else in the world with his knowledge or understanding of this specific location. Mr. McCurry points out major problems with the groundwater analysis before you. Please consider these important concerns, and please consider giving us another minute. Two minutes is simply not enough. Thank you, Peter. Okay, last two. Joy Barra is up and Harlan Savage is on deck. Joy, you can unmute now. Okay. Hello, thank you. Uh, I'm Joy Barrett. I'm a Boulder resident and also a CU civil engineering graduate. I am asking OSBT not to dispose of city owned land to facilitate CU's planned development of CU South. I um, wanted to touch briefly on wetlands protection. A number of speakers have already addressed the threatened and rare species that will be affected. And it's, it's um, it's clear that construction of the dam and its impervious flood wall uh, down to the bedrock will destroy the habitat and also affect the groundwater flows that feed wetlands on both sides of 36. In terms of loss of open space, uh, see you with the proposed and or planned 2.5 million square feet of development was supposed to be entirely open space at one point in time because of its location in the South Boulder Creek floodplain. CU is going to dedicate just a small fraction of the land for open space under the current annexation agreement. And obviously this is gonna be a huge loss for the environment as has been previously discussed by numerous people and also a loss for the community. In terms of flood protection and mitigation, Experts have recommended a 500 year or more flood mitigation for the CU South site, but unfortunately the current flood mitigation proposal is based on a 100 year storm design and that is absolutely inadequate. While OSBT is not charged with protecting Boulder residents and their homes, it's inappropriate to facilitate a development that leaves Boulder residents at risk. Finally, as was mentioned by the previous speaker, I wanna talk about respect for the democratic process. This November, uh, citizens will vote and OSBT, if it approves, will be facilitating ecological damage and disregarding the right of Boulder voters to have a say in the future of this fragile and complex ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. I'm not seeing Harlan Savage. So Harlan, if you are here or under a different name, please raise your hand. We'll move on to raised hands now. Anyone who didn't sign up in advance and wants to speak. Lynn Siegel, see your hand is up. Lynn, you can unmute now. Yeah, um, this is a huge expense of my money, taxpayer money, um, to, to move forward with this consideration before the referendum. It's just a folly that should not be done. Um, the, the, um, the disposal request should not be recommended. The disposal request should not be investigated. It's not worth anything it's not worth all the money that we put into it so far. It's not worth it considering that CU already benefited hugely in a corrupt process when they bought it in 1996 of an elevation of the value of it, an inflated value. I mean, as if we don't have enough problem with inflated values of housing in Boulder. This was an inflated value so that Boulder was unable to purchase the property, which should have been 9 million and was raised up to 16 million because Flatirons Gravel Company could get a tax deduction, which they didn't even get in the end. 
how can the city of Boulder be so compliant and so be so inconsiderate of taxpayer funds on this folly? Wait until you can see how you can equitably affect all the people in Boulder and not selectively work on one floodplain when we've got 15 total. I can't believe this is happening. It's just not right. Thank you, Lynn. I don't see any other hands. Okay. Um, I'm now gonna turn the, the uh, floor back to the board for questions of clarification on the report that Brandon gave and on the materials that we have from the uh, May 11th packet and from the June 8th packet. So who would like sure. to go? I'm, I'm happy to go first. Uh, first off, uh, congratulations on your promotion, Brandon. Uh, and uh, th thank you uh, and Joe both for your thoughtful answers um, in the packet last month. Um, uh, a lot of the community members had concerns around, you know, uh, is this developed well? Is this going to harm the environment? I was curious if you all could comment on what sorts of agencies are going to be uh, approving a project like this um, at the federal level, state level. What sorts of environmental agencies are going to have to sign off on this? I imagine there's quite a few that are going to have to review this. Um, these are experts who review flood mitigation projects all the time, um, you know, that might give the community uh, uh, a sense that you know this is being reviewed by experts and that th this is a good design. I might want to jump in on that one uh, first. Uh, I'll let Brandon speak to the details of the of the agencies that will be reviewing the project. But um, as everyone knows, there's a referendum coming up on this in in this election, and I just wanted to thank the members of the public for attending the meeting tonight and and stating their views on the project. I, I definitely understand the passion for open space and, and the environment and um, share that with you as does Brandon and we're we're determined to reduce the impacts of the project as well as with the mitigation plan and the OSO um, establish other features that will enhance the environment out there. But with respect to the referendum, I do want to make some clarifications based on on what we heard in open comment, because I think it's really important for the public to have factual information. A number of the commenters, um, I, I feel like it was implied that the likelihood of failure of this structure is, is fairly high. And having spent the early part of my career in, in dam design as Brandon is doing now, I know that the structural elements of many of the features in, in a dam have a safety factor of three, meaning the, the anticipated loading conditions that you think are going to be on them, you, you make a wall three times thicker than it needs to be to hold it. Da there are dam failures in the world for sure, but it is a rare event. So the suggestion that the likelihood of this structure um, to fail is high, including the groundwater system, which is, is simply sand filters and pipes, which are fairly basic technology. I just, I, I don't agree with that characterization and I don't think it's a fair characterization for people who um, are trying to form an opinion on this project. Um, there was also some commentary on the groundwater system and reference to a, a community expert who has weighed in. We uh, on the project team, in addition to hiring experts to do the modeling work, we hired an independent expert who has similar credentials to the person who is referenced and does not share the same perspective that you heard about with the individual referenced. In the past, there's been a suggestion that we have community member panels and, and things to get into the design of the project, which I, I am uh, not in favor of for the work going forward. And, if we're going to refer to community experts, 
and, and their technical opinions on the projects, I think it's really important to know if they're aligned with any of the advocacy groups that are following this project, either for or against. Um, so I just wanted to say that. I also, the, the, there was a comment that the groundwater system is unfamiliar to, to staff and hasn't been done before. Brandon gave two examples. The, the underground stuff is not my technical background. I, I used to do design on spillways and the hydraulic part of them when I was doing the technical work. But I've talked to some other dam designers and there are other examples we can cite in addition to what we shared tonight. So um, I, I feel pretty strongly at this point in the project, it's important that factual information be shared and for community members who are trying to form an opinion um, for them to have the facts and welcome anyone, regardless of their opinion on the project, to reach out to me or Brandon if you'd like to discuss it. Brandon, I'll turn it to you to, uh, to talk about the agencies and to more directly answer John's question. Sure, yeah. Uh, thank you, John. Yeah, so um, there is a long list of permitting agencies that are going to be involved with the project and currently are involved with the project. So from an environmental permitting standpoint, um, there will be a lead agency. So there are waters of US on the that would be impacted by the project. So that means the Army Corps of Engineers would lead that process through the 404 process, which is a portion of the Clean Water Act, and that would create a federal nexus. So they would be in charge of consulting with Fish and Wildlife, uh, State Historic Preservation Office, and yes. So the federal agencies that would be approving the project, and they would also be considering indirect impacts. Um, uh, so if we didn't have a groundwater system that would work, um, they would be considering that a, a potentially an indirect impact uh, to wetlands in the area. So we do have those as federal agencies. We also have the Colorado uh, State Engineer, and uh, they'll be reviewing the project from a dam safety standpoint. So they'll be very concerned with dam failure, um, structural integrity, uh, groundwater going underneath the foundation. I think it's really important. So that's why the system has to be designed how it is, because it does have to be safe in the context of passing groundwater and um, keeping that going forward. Um, we also have CDOT will be a permitting uh, agency as well as a stakeholder with the CDOT right of way, similar to what OSMP is as a stakeholder um, with a property owner that we have to work with um, going forward to have the project actually come to fruition. And then lastly on my list here, FEMA, um, and I hope I said it, but the Corps will be consulting with Fish and Wildlife for Threatened and Endangered Species. I know that's a really important one. So we will be consulting with Fish and Wildlife through the Army Corps of Engineers. And then lastly, City of Boulder has a wetland ordinance as well, which is actually more stringent um, than what the Army Corps is. So that will probably be the leading um, requirement in how much mitigation is going to be required to offset our impacts. So just, I think that's a lot of them. <laughs> there, there may be some more in there, but that's uh, my pretty comprehensive list I have right now. So hopefully that helps answer the question. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Brandon. It sounds like a lot of very smart people will review this project before it's built. Um, one of the other things that was implied by some of the speakers was that this is an inadequate amount of flood protection. Um, you know, when I first hear about 100 year versus 500 year, your mind immediately thinks 500 year is five times as much as 100 year. Um, but that that's actually not the case is my understanding. Could you clarify that a little bit? Yeah, so we did um, review the project and there are some limitations just geometrically, particularly with the US 36 embankment that makes a 500 year flood protection not feasible. Um, but the 100 year is actually what we as a utility in the storm flood utility are striving for through the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Um, we're currently working on our master plan update. So that's really the level of service um, that we're striving for. And South Boulder Creek in particular has a very good definition around the hydrology, which is the rainfall and the flooding potential that happens on the basins. And then also the hydraulics, um, because we've done a site specific hydrology report so we've looked at historic storms, paleo flood, 
um, to come up with what is the risk for South Boulder Creek, which is not common for a lot of drainage ways. Um, there's usually standard methods you use. And then we also have a 2D regulatory model, which helps us define the flood risk. So um, South Boulder Creek's very unique, but we do have a really good um, understanding of the flooding around there. And also we've looked at kind of the feasibility of going above that and um, really found some difficult constraints with that. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Brandon. Um, in an effort, you know, as uh, board members, I think it's our responsibility to, uh, you know, uh, make sure that the truth is out there and information's out there. There are multiple community members who made accusations of conspiracy and illegal activity uh, by city council. And um, yes, the annexation was passed by emergency, uh, the same way that scooters were banned by emergency. Um, and if that's considered an emergency, I think flood mitigation should be as well. Um, so I, I just wanted to point out that that is not indeed correct and it was passed by emergency for good reason. So um, I don't have any other questions at the moment. I'll pass it back to you, Karen. Thanks, John. Uh, Caroline, did you wanna go next? Sorry, trying to unmute. Um, you can let someone else go. I'm kind of um, thinking about what John said. So um, if someone else wants to, to take okay. my place, I'll go back in. Yeah, um, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Joe and for Brandon and the whole team for producing materials that could be mostly understood by somebody who's not an engineer or um, wants to pretend to be one. Um, so I found the materials to be fairly understandable. I did, uh, Google is my friend. <laughs> so I had to look up some of these terms to make sure I understood them. So, but um, just sort of the technical terms. Um, I too um, share some of the concerns around the public comment there. I know people are asking us to not approve disposal. We are not even being requested to dispose tonight or anytime soon. Um, and, you know, the, the idea when I, I, I think about of all the materials that I read and the modeling that has to happen, I think about like, gosh, you know, when we go on top of a bridge <laughs> and all of the structural engineering that goes into that, there's way smarter people than me who have done those estimations. Sure, sometimes um, bridges fail as sometimes um, dams fail, um, you know, what is, it, what is that trade-off? And I heard this earlier this evening too, to say, are 600 structures worth it? Are three and a half percent of the, the humans in that area worth it? I think, you know, it would be ridiculous to ask that of the Marshall Fire victims. And so in an era where we have that recent disaster, I find that to be very insensitive to think about um, the people who would be impacted. Um, you know, that's, that's where I come from when, um, you know, thinking about this project, about the flood mitigation aspect of it. I'm not concerned, our, our scope is not within the development. I know that's passion of folks and I appreciate that. Um, I, I am concerned about um, how, how this project does uh, protect open space and I feel like, a lot of the analysis and the, the, the smart people that we have in the room who have high ethical standards um, ought to be respected for their expertise. And I know for sure I appreciate that. So thank you. Okay, uh, Caroline or Dave, who wants to go next? Um, I can just do, I might have something else um, after Dave, but <laughs> just really quickly, Brandon, um, and, and also congratulations on, on your promotion and, and thank you guys for being here today and presenting for us. Um, when, and, and like Michelle, Google is my friend, so I can look it up um, if it's easier than you sending it, but I believe you were talking about the Fort Bragg project um, and you were saying that the EPA considered that one a successful project. You know, that's obviously like beachside and, and a different 
you know, type of layout. But if they have since the 90s when that was done, um, five every five years or 10 years have, has done a report where they talk about the success of the project, I would like to um, read that report. So I don't know if when you reference that, if that was something that you've been able to put your hands on and look at that you could send to the board or um, if you just had a snippet of that. And and again, I'm happy to, to search, but I didn't know if you had that. Sure. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd be happy to share the references for both of those projects that we had. Um, and you can see, and just in context, they are environmental mitigation projects, but they are required to collect and distribute groundwater. So that's a key component, but success for them is also environmental mitigation. So there'll be a lot of the contaminant numbers and things like that in there as well. But um, I'm happy to share those resources with the board uh, after the meeting. Yeah, that'd be great. I just think that would be um, helpful since we use that as a reference tonight. Um, Caroline, yeah. while you're on that, yeah. uh, Brandon, can you tell us, has is there flooding or has there been flooding in either of those locations? Uh, I am not uh, aware of any flooding. I We didn't look at flooding specifically. Those projects were not designed as flood mitigation projects. Um, what, what it was really focusing on was the groundwater collection conveyance through a groundwater barrier. So a man-made groundwater barrier and then distribution on the downstream side. So that's really the piece of our system that those projects relate to. Um, so, so we don't I, know whether those systems have, have survived a flooding event. No, and they're all subsurface. So they, they are not associated with flood mitigation at all, but um, we'll look for any of that, but I, I doubt there's any of that type of connection. And the one that I was um, referencing in, in Port Bragg is on the ocean. So with tide, I don't even know if that would be considered flooding or if it was, you know, high tide, low tide or a storm that caused, you know, that would just be like really different, but I, yeah. I thought that would be helpful for us to be able to take a look at. Yeah. And the key component of our system, so we're designing it, the purpose of our system is maintaining groundwater conditions in the adjacent property. So that's for low, high groundwater conditions. What happens is when our flood mitigation project fills up, it actually becomes a completely different condition. So we're looking at both of those conditions. I haven't talked about that high hydraulic loading condition as much because I think that's really my job and dam safety's job is we work together on that because that's really a dam safety concern because what you'll see is once you have a we call it a high head but a lot of water on the upstream side it actually can push water through your pipes to where that would be a failure mode we have to look at so we're actually designing for both of those scenarios but Tonight, I just really focused on kind of exactly what the public commenters were talking about was maintaining the groundwater um, in the adjacent properties, because that's actually really uh, an important design goal of the project. And then um, I do think that I had a question related to the last slide that you um, had pulled up, and my apologies if everyone else can see this better than me, but <clears throat> maybe it was just a safe space. We just had quarter one and quarter three. And where we were, where it was written today, and you look down, if, if I was looking at it correctly, the 30% the is not done. Um, it, it's still a bit out. It, it, can you just confirm with me? It, it looks to me like it would be like maybe one more month before. Yeah, so we, so as city staff, like with uh, our expertise, and we have some other expertise within the city internally, we review those design documents. Um, and we provide those comments back to the consultants. So we've actually done that review internally as city staff and provided our comments back to the consultants. So that's the last piece we have to sort out. And as soon as that whole package is complete, we'll post that to the project webpage, which will likely happen around the end of this month. And then um, I heard you, I just wanna make sure that I wrote it down right. Those consultants, is it Western Fell and Headwater? So RJH is our prime consultant. So they're doing the flood mitigation design. Uh, working with OSMP, we really felt they didn't have the expertise we needed for the OSO mitigation design. So we worked with them to go out and actually 
um, solicit consultants that do have that expertise to focus on the OSO mitigation. So now we've hired Westervelt and Headwaters as a team, um, as a sub-consultant to RJH to really focus on those mitigation uh, of the OSO and the levy removal. And that'll feed into our environmental permitting and also our hydraulic design. Okay, and, and my apologies if I just, <laughs> if it's just hard of hearing. Are, you're saying Western Fell, like F-E-L-L? -L? Westervelt, so it's W-E-S-T-E-R, double, or V-E-L-T. I think I got that right. Okay. <laughs> if you talk to enough engineers, spelling is not our strong suit, but I'm, <laughs> I, I'm happy to share that information. So they are working with OSMP currently, and um, I can spell that correctly. That's fine. And then um, just to clarify, because I, I think that I, I didn't quite catch all of this. So um, what you just said was um, R, RJH, either them or you or whoever just decided they might not be the best fit for the OSO mitigation design, which was why you teamed up with the Western Felton Headwater. Um, I yes. Yeah, and that was a joint decision. I, I think it was really discussions between utilities and open space. So, I mean, internally, I will say we're trying to treat this as a joint project, particularly uh, the OSO mitigation, because there is so much benefit potentially to open space. And we're talking about management activities. There's a lot that goes into mitigation efforts, and we have tons of expertise internally through our OSMP staff. So, we're trying to partner with them as much as possible. Um, and that's in review of the flood mitigation design, but also in uh, design of this OSO mitigation and what concepts we could look at over there. And since we're talking so much about the groundwater conveyance tonight, will both of these um, consultant companies be, be doing the groundwater or will one or the other more, more so take charge? So RJH will be doing the groundwater conveyance system design, and they also have a team of groundwater experts who's doing that groundwater conveyance design. I'm sure when we talk about mitigation, we'll be talking about groundwater as well, because um, wetlands will be one of the desired um, habitats that we're trying to create with our mitigation efforts and groundwater plays a key part in that. Okay, and then um, I think my final, it's not really a question, you just wanted to clarify, um, you might not even remember how the wording was, um, but at the very beginning of our <laughs> presentation from you, um, it showed, you know, the picture that we're all very used to of the strip of the five acres that's right next to 36, and um, you had said it's 90 feet off of open space, um, and in my head when you said that, I was like, is it not 90 feet? into open space and i don't know if that's just a play on words i just wanted to make sure that that we're on that i'm on the same page it, yes that's correct so 90 feet from the cdot right of way into open space that's the area we're talking about okay great thank you dave would you like to go next sure uh, thanks, you guys, uh, for the update. Uh, I, I still have some major concerns, though, and I guess fundamentally, um, I'm worried about the 30% the design in the absence of any substantive information on specific impacts or mitigation to open space. And Joe, I think you referenced tonight that that was the point of both the memo and the presentation, but I'm still not hearing anything specific about those impacts. And I'm particularly troubled by just a, a phrase on page uh, 13 of the memo where it says, uh, you're listing impact to t &E species and uh, what might mitigation be for those. And it, it, it ends up with, if possible, you lady tresses orchid habitat. And it's like, what, what does that mean? Um, you know, it's not if possible. It's like there has to be some substantive mitigation for list, you know, federally listed species. So uh, I'm really concerned about that. And Brandon, then on, the, on that last uh, schedule, you know, uh, bar chart, it, it appears to me that 
you're in conversations, at least from the bar chart, um, with some of the permitting agencies, and yet none of that was referenced in this memo. And I, I guess I'm concerned that when we always are saying, well, we'll wait until the 60% design stage. And for me, 60% is more than half, and it's pretty much a fait accompli. And so it looks to me like it's an after action uh, effort on mitigation when I think uh, the mitigation as the board resolutions over the years has suggested should be front and center. And that's really the important factor in the open space board's consideration of whether or not uh, disposal is warranted. So anyway, I'm, I'm disappointed. Uh, quite frankly, um, and I, I don't know if, if the next time you're back, you're at 60%, uh, I would suggest that we need to hear from you guys uh, well before that, because um, the, the, in the 30%, there's no 30% of the mitigation, you know, and, and that's, I think, the key thing for us. Right, and, and I can probably help fill in some of the blanks. I agree with you, the mitigation is not as far as the rest of the design is at this point. Um, but I think we've been working on the flood mitigation concepts probably for at least 10 years, if not more. So um, that is much further along. And really the mitigation focused on the OSO, we weren't sure how much of the OSO we were gonna have to be able to work with until the CU South annexation agreement came through. And that came in at the end of September last year. So we really have taken that annexation agreement, tried to leverage it as much as we can. And by getting our design consultants on board, um, it, it really helps us start that design process. And really we are talking to the agencies currently for permitting and really to come up with a mitigation approach that's acceptable to them. We all have to agree on what the impacts are gonna be. So that's really what the conversations are right now with the permitting agencies. And that's what the 30% gets us is a footprint of where we think impacts are gonna be. And um, like you said, resources, wetlands, what are those impacts? What's the, what's the project components associated with them. Um, so we are working on that right now. And uh, ideally, we'd love to bring something back on the OSO mitigation um, as we work on it. I, th I think that would be very helpful. And I have just one a minor example of that, Brandon. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, because my eyesight isn't all that great. But in the one of the maps it, in the packet, it looked to me like uh, the construction staging area, and I'm talking about for uh, the CU South property, was in the OSO uh, delineated area. And, you know, it just struck me as if, if we're using that for, for resource mitigation or impact mitigation, why are we delineating it as a construction staging area as part of the project? Sure. And, and I think that's the type of stuff um, we're working through. That's why it's a 30% design. So there's a big box kind of for staging area. And as we progress with the design, that'll get tighter and tighter. Um, we do have work. Mitigation is not just protection. So it's key component of the mitigation would be removal of the levy as well. So there would be construction that would be occurring in that OSO area to give us a project that would actually create the habitats and kind of meet the goals that we're shooting for into the future. So I, I think um, I wouldn't say there will be no work in the OSO area because that's actually what we're striving for. It's an old gravel pit. We want to try and connect it to the adjacent habitat as best we can and really strive for the um, ecosystems that we're going to try and identify with open space staff for mitigation and really come up with a more comprehensive plan for that OSO area. Well, I certainly understand the remo uh, levy removal uh, and, and that sort of thing. I guess my concern is that if there's, you know, if we're using that area as a heavy equipment uh, location, storage, and, and fill storage, and all that kind of thing, it just seems counter intuitive to say, well, we're going to, we're going to really end up making this a lot better when in fact, what we're doing much of the time is making it a lot worse. 
And so from my perspective, it would be like, look, if we're gonna have a construction staging area, it ought to be on the part of the CU South property that's gonna be developed. Um, and basically, you know, the natural value is destroyed rather than the area where we're gonna to try to, you know, either maintain or restore those natural values. Anyway. Right. So I and I will say, I, we really value our relationship with open space staff because they give a lot of very similar comments that we're not catching necessarily without that uh, lens. So like our partnership with John and Don, like they give us a lot of these comments even before we come to you guys as the board and we start to work on those. So um, these are really valuable comments, I will say. Um, and also you guys got some great staff who's really looking out for your resources uh, with John and Don, and I'm really happy to have them on the team because they give us a lot of these comments as well. We, <laughs> it's surprisingly enough, this is not the first time we hear a lot of this stuff, so. I, I'm sure that Don, you know, he's, he, he's been <laughs> around the block a couple of times. <laughs> So, so may I ask, may I ask something that Brandon, you're welcome to say, yes, we've heard that, but we just haven't done anything about it yet, which is something that Dave touched on. And I can't believe that Don and John haven't talked to you about it. My question is what happens with soil compaction? Once you have all this heavy equipment on the soils on the, in the wet meadow area, uh, isn't there soil compaction? and and what does that do? Uh, I know what it's going to do to the ladies' tresses orchids and the and the uh, unique grass communities. But what is it going to do to the groundwater? Um, we haven't talked specifically about soil compaction, but I think one of the big things we're doing is trying to work within this ninety foot corridor. So I think if you look at this corridor, um, I'll equate this to the Carter Lake pipeline, which that was a single pipeline that I think had a 120 foot corridor for one pipeline installation. So what we're doing is, if you think about it, we're doing two pipelines, a flood wall and a foundation in a much tighter corridor than that. And we're still, I think those are the best comments we get from John and Don are particularly the outlet works. Like that was something we probably wouldn't have noticed this early in the stage without their um, involvement in the project. But those are the opportunities we're looking for is how do we limit our footprint and keep our impacts as minimal as we can to get this project uh, built? Because once we, we don't want to expand it more than we have to. Brandon, if I can, if I can add sure. to what you're saying and really appreciate the, the feedback from the board members and, and, uh, Dave, I can appreciate your comment and concerns about the level of development on the environmental side. Um, going from conceptual to 30% design, we really need to, to get to a level of detail on what the footprint is, is going to look like. And, and then the permitting discussions can start in earnest. So there is a little bit of a lag, I would say in my experience in, on projects, but uh, perhaps we haven't done a very good job of of managing expectations and um, on the on the Gantt chart that Brandon showed and the development of the OSO that's that's starting now in the second quarter and and we'll have have a lot for you by the end of the year on that. So I think uh, I, I think some of these concerns will be addressed as we go through the phases of the projects and and um, uh, hopefully you will be satisfied with the environmental mitigation. And in terms of the soil compaction, there are construction procedures for uncompacting soil once you get to that, that phase of the restoration, which we'll, we'll be getting into those details, I would imagine. And Brandon, correct me if I'm wrong, a little bit further along in the process. Brandon, did you want to say anything about that? Uh, no, I think Joe's right. I mean, really our focus right now in working with OSMP is how do we limit our impacts as much as possible so that if we don't drive outside those limits, then there can't be soil compaction. But um, yeah, we're, we're really focusing on that, particularly with this 30% design. 
Um, both CDOT and CU limited their exposure to impacts um, with public statements in 2019 that said, you won't be working on our properties. Um, and that's when this uh, secant flood wall and groundwater conveyance system moved to be entirely on open space and mountain parks land. Um, at one time, there was discussion with the board, um, with the staff that is here tonight, about having some of the construction be on the CDOT right of way and some of it being on OSMP land. Um, at this point, have you done anything to, to reverse the written disapproval of CDOT from September 2019? Um, and can we move some of the construction onto the CDOT right of way instead of putting it all on open space and mountain parks land? Yeah, I, I will say um, we do, one of the key things was that CDOT connection point. So we do have that connection point and we've moved that as far away from South Boulder Creek as feasible based on the elevations uh, related to US 36 embankment. So I think that that was a really important piece of the project there. And we are actively working with CDOT um, to see what we can do in the right of way. The, the problem with the CDOT right of way is um, there are a lot of utilities also located in the right of way. So we're trying to balance that as much as we can on um, what infrastructure can move over there and then what utilities are in the way in conflict. So um, I think those are still things we're going to be working on. But um, yes, I, I think it's a good question. And we have definitely been talking about that a lot. How far over can we get that? And what kind of written agreement do you have from CDOT at this point, or is the September 9th, 2019 letter still the only commun written communication? Uh, we've been working with CDOT throughout the process. So we've had meetings with them. They are part of our monthly meeting now. Um, we're working with their design engineers as well. So um, we do, you know, they're part of our team at this point. Um, we are working on hopefully getting an agreement with them here in the near term. And uh, then that will be, I think, what you're referencing. Okay. Um, the other comment that's been made um, repeatedly is, is um, the goal of not overtopping 36 and therefore flooding the West Valley. Um, it's my understanding from reading the packet that if there is a flood that's greater than a hundred year flood, this system will lead to overtopping of 36. Is that correct? It, the system will, if there's flood waters above a hundred year, it will spill over the spillway. That's why I, I reference it as a spillway. There will still be benefits. So it's, um, it's not I'm like the project. I don't, not I don't there. disregard the benefits. I'm just asking, will it overtop 36? Uh, yes, eventually. So if the flood flows are big enough, it would go over there. So that'd be um, a much larger storm event. And then what we see is if you compare it to existing conditions today, even a 500 year, you would still see flooding in that area, but it would be reduced with the project in place for a 500 year flood. Okay, so it will overtop uh, Highway 36 if it's greater than a hundred year. Uh, then tell me about the, the reconstruction of the open space other. Um, I have a much greater understanding based on the packet of um, the alluvium in the wet meadow versus the lack of alluvium on the CU South property. And I'm wondering whether um, as part of mitigation, there will be a reconstruction of alluvium where it does not now exist on open space other? I, I think we're too early in the process to answer that question right now. So I, 
Okay, um, so when you come back, I, you'll have that question, uh, yeah. a mitigation plan. I think so. Once we start talking about the mitigation plan, we would have recommendations for how to get to those ecosystems that we're shooting for. Okay. Um, and I'm sure you, you know, despite the part that uh, Dave referred to on page 13, that no one knows how to uh, reconstruct a Ute Ladies Tresses orchid population. Is that right? I can uh, maybe address that, Brandon, if you want. Um, yeah, well, when we did the last disposal along US 36. Yeah, uh, and, moved, and move orchids up to the granite property, they didn't appear. That did not work for OSMP. Uh, I will note that we've observed that the wetland mitigation that actually the gravel company did inside the levee has resulted in significant Ute Ladies Trusses orchid habitat and populations in there. So there is some um, hope that we will be able to replicate and expand on that within the um, within this the exact same area in the OSO. So hopefully we can come up with ways to do that. Not guaranteed by any, and it's very difficult. There's no question, but it, it was um, it, it was encouraging that. Uh, previous wetland mitigations in those areas have been successful at Ute Lady Tress's orchid uh, population uh, coming into those areas. So. Okay. And then on the, uh, I guess I'll just mention also on the alluvium question you had. One thing we're, we're trying to take like a hundred year or more perspective on this and reconnecting the floodplain as part of this mitigation will over time theoretically result in additional alluvium coming in across this whole area and over time we'll will restore will re continue to restore this area as a as a as a great hopefully asset um, along South Boulder Creek. Are are you referring to geologic time or human? no over over hundreds of years of flood events uh, from the you know 10 year to the 50 year to the 100 year um, will uh, will bring alluvium into the system. But we're presum presumably gonna have vegetation reestablished on the top, right? So it's not gonna be underlying the vegetation. Yeah, all, all I'm pointing out is that we're, tr we're trying to create a dynamic system here that is going to continue to improve and get better with time. Um, that, that's, a com that's a component of a good, good mitigation project as well. Okay. Um, John, in the interest of pursuing John's uh, vision of truth, I just wanna point out that the Spiranthes in the OSO are probably genetic anomalies, just so we know. And uh, in fact, they may they may have genetic capabilities uh, to be more potentially restorative than than others. But uh, I, uh, I it would be good to do the genetics uh, on those plants and see how they uh, relate to other Spiranthes elsewhere in the vicinity. That's an interesting speculation, Dave, and we can certainly. I'll uh, look into doing that if we want to spend the resources on something we'll, like that. We'll ask Don to do that in his spare time. And, and I have I have a lot of that. I, I apologize for keeping my camera off. If I turn it on, um, I lose the connection. But um, there, oh, there are also... Um, I don't know things. Don's voice. That's Don D'Amico's talking. Right? Oh, I'm sorry. The, um, so there are there are uh, spiranthes that have colonized the formal gravel pit um, that open space now owns south of the um, South Boulder Creek Trail on the Fancher property. So um, it is it is interesting, Dave, how they they seem to have colonized uh, old gravel pits um, in, in this particular area. Um, there is some speculation and um, you know, thoughts on why that occurred. Um, it, you know, gra gravel mining is a very disruptive process, much, well, somewhat similar to flooding, um, erosion of floodplains and that sort of thing that create um, habitat that's open enough for spiranthes to 
to colonize and, and then um, kind of populate over time. But um, yeah, it, it is, uh, it, it's interesting. We, um, we made uh, um, heroic efforts, maybe I'll call them to um, repopulate, to, to transplant and recreate um, Spiranthes habitat on the granite property, as you mentioned, Karen, with little success. Um, but then um, they, they happened to colonize uh, properties that we made no effort to uh, get them to move into. So, Don, maybe I should retract my comments on uh, construction staging on OSO and say we ought to actually stage as much as possible there and dis disturb it as much as we can because maybe that's in fact what Spiranthes needs. Uh, could be, yeah. Uh, uh, while we're on wetlands and Spiranthes, I want to go to th three different maps of the wetlands in this area. One is from our December packet, which shows uh, wetlands and mute ladies tresses orchid habitat according to the best pro professional judgment of Corbus. Um, and it specifically uses the term mute ladies tresses orchid habitat. Then in the May 11th packet, there are two maps that show wetlands and mute ladies tresses orchids. Uh, that's an RJH map uh, that shows large extents of Ute Ladies Tresses orchids. And then there are the maps that I've seen at OSMP that field biologists have created, which show actual occurrences of Ute Ladies Tresses orchids. So what I'm trying to understand is to go to John's point, what's accurate? I could, I could go out there and look at the amount of, of uh, wet meadow and vegetation and say, well, based on my experience, I would expect to see you ladies tresses orchids here, here, and here, and here, and draw lines on a map. Or I could go to the field biologist's maps showing where there are actual populations of Ute ladies tresses orchids, which are, as you know, John, years old. But I believe no field biologists have gone out on this state natural area in recent years and actually mapped Ute ladies tresses orchids. Is that true? I don't know what you mean by that, Karen. Um, I believe the, uh, that there have been surveys, uh, I think Brandon, you can confirm there have been surveys done on the CU South property um, where they were looking for Ute Ladies Tress orchids during, um, during their flowering period. Uh, I, I know there were biologists out um, do, doing monitoring uh, at, at the right times in the spring and into the summer uh, on those sites. We certainly do it on open space properties routinely, um, not always to the extent of some of the maps that, that um, you're referring to, but um, you know, not every year. But, um, and, and you know, one of the things uh, to understand about Spiranthes is that they don't necessarily flower every year. So you, you can't always determine whether the population in the, in the habitat is um, there at a certain year or not. So that's why we also depend on evaluations of habitat and you know, the possibility of um, Spiranthes being on, on a particular site. And uh, Karen, Don D'Amico again. Um, so one more point of clarification. A lot of those maps are created using different data. So for example, um, one Spiranthes map you might be looking at was created based on field surveys that Open Space did, which are very, very um, detailed. Uh, we actually go out and run transects and count individual plants and then look at, at create polygons of certain densities of, of plants um, and actually map map their occurrence, their elemental occurrence. Um, I wish Lynn Riedel was here because she could speak to this better than I can. But, um, and then other 
other spiranthes maps of spiranthes habitat could be based on um, uh, suitable habitat, habitat that's occupied by associate species. Sometimes they're, they're called species that commonly occur with spiranthes under certain hydrologic conditions. So that could create a, a completely different map showing a, a polygon where quote unquote spiranthes are. Um, the same thing with uh, wetland mapping. Um, some wetland mapping has been created in the past based on vegetation alone. Um, and so the, the vegetation that we see in an area uh, um, is made up of a preponderance of, of wetland obligate or facultative wetland species. So by, by virtue of, of that definition, we can call that area a wetland. And other wetland areas or other wetland maps are created from a delineation that requires documentation of the three parameters that create jurisdictional wetlands or identified jurisdictional wetlands, I should say, um, vegetation, hydrology, and soils. So it's a, it's a bit confusing because it's you see a spiranthes map or you see a wetland map, but uh, there should be a paragraph at the bottom of each one explaining how those maps were created from uh, you know from the data. Well, the only one that has any information at the bottom of it is that for in the December packet, and it said it is this map was created using Corvus's best professional judgment. Um, that doesn't sound to me like it's taken from the, the OSMP veg maps. So, so, so I- is the, is, the, is the RJH map from uh, the May packet, is that from the OSMP veg maps or which, which of these maps are from the OSMP veg maps? I'd ha I would have to take a close look at those, Karen. I, I can't tell you off the top of my head. Okay, I, I'd really appreciate getting that information just so I know what we're, what we're looking at. Okay. Um, but I wanna come back to the, the question um, that was asked previously about, um, what assurances will we have? And this may be a question, Brandon, that needs to be deferred to the mitigation plan, but I, it's a question that as an open space board member, I think is important. And that is what assurances do we have that the impacts will be limited to the five acres as opposed to uh, the vegetation or wetlands or uh, occurrences of other species upstream and downstream from the project itself. And, and when will the, the statements be made about the consequences if um, the assurances are not met? Uh, so I can only comment on the technical side of the design. So, Typically, we wouldn't put a groundwater conveyance system in on a project like this. So that is one thing that we are doing to address the groundwater concerns. We are designing it with that baseline groundwater model that we presented on in December and also using this proposed groundwater's model, which is really informing our 30% design. Um, that is what we're presenting to Army Corps and Fish and Wildlife to off mitigate our indirect impacts. So they're ultimately the permitting agency we're gonna be reporting to. On top of that, um, that baseline groundwater model was based on numerous groundwater wells we've installed kind of all over the site, upstream and downstream of US 36. The intent would be to continue that monitoring, monitoring even after the project's in place. So that's really the best way technically that you can evaluate the function of a system like this. If, if I can add, Brandon, thanks, thanks for that response. But um, that's a tricky question to answer. It's a, a tricky construction of the question because it assumes that there's, again, a high likelihood that these um, dam components are going to fail. And this, no, this I, I didn't mean to ask it that way, Joe. I'm just trying to ask it in terms of 
what assurances are there that it will not fail? The state engineer will be reviewing the design package of the dam components and, and the way they function, and they won't approve it if, if there's not like any other dam or, or bridge or structure that people's lives rely on, they won't approve it if it's if there's a problem or it's not proven technology or that kind of thing and, and there's any likelihood that it will fail. But for OSBT, the issue is not specifically dam safety and loss of life. It's ecological right. um, occurrence in perpetuity. So I and I think maybe to reframe your question a little bit, Karen, I think when you say fail, you mean not convey groundwater as designed um, and you see either actually mounding, I mean not sustain the ecosystem it, that's there. OK. Well, I'll have to follow up on that because the best way we're doing this is um, addressing groundwater. So I think we've definitely heard concern around groundwater being a key component of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So that's what our design component is focused around right now. We do not want to touch anything outside of this 90 foot corridor. So that's really um, important to us. So we're really focusing on what we can do within our design corridor. Karen, I don't know if you can um, see my hand. I, I was um, raising it and I'm, I'm fine to wait. I just wasn't sure if you were able to see me. Do you have a question that's related to this or something else? No, no, it was, it was something else. It, it was kind of tied into a while back, but you can keep going you know, with what you're doing. I just wanted to let you know just in case you couldn't see me. Well, why don't you go ahead and, and then I'll ask other questions afterwards. Okay, um, I, th I think mine will be quick. <clears throat> when when we started this, it was that we would get the um, uh, presentation at the at the end of the thirty percent design, and we're not quite at the end of the thirty percent design, which might help answer some of these questions moving forward. So my question, and then I also heard staff say that we would kind of be following up at the end of the year. So um, since we're not at the th end of the 30% design, were we planning on having like a, a proper presentation when when that 30% was was truly complete? Or um, or was it planned for for this time and, and that extension is still there? I don't know who I'm asking this question to, but will we will we have a presentation at the end of the 30% that may help answer some of these questions? I, I guess I would say we, this is the 30% design presentation as we had kind of planned it. Um, as we so said- is the a few, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Uh, sure. So is the additional stuff um, that's still, you know, lingering for, for the true completion um, part of the OSO mitigation? Is that what still needs to be worked out with the the? Well, I think we in the memo we tried to give you a snapshot of the thirty percent design as it related to impacts to OSMP. Um, we will share the full design documents on the web page towards the end of this month, and I would say you're the public, anybody's more than welcome to read through those documents, look at the full plan set, the full design report, um, and. You can always, like Joe said, always reach out to us if there's questions or anything like that. Um, that's kind of our job. So we will be sharing that. I We had not planned to come back for another 30% touch point, and that's probably not my place to say. So I'll let maybe somebody else chime in. Yeah, and I'll let other board members, if they think that this is like, you know, good for that. And, and once that's posted, that that's fine. Or, or if some of these questions that are coming up um, if, if that would somehow help everyone to be on the, the same page, I'll let you know um, anyone weigh in after I'm done, how they feel about that. Um, the other thing that should be relatively quick and this is for board members is <clears throat> during public comment, you know, we, we all heard um, there was a member, uh, Peter Mayer, that made the suggestion that the two minutes was a bit short uh, for this and would prefer for this to be three minutes. Um, I personally have no problem with that. And, and hearing the community member ask for that, I'm happy to oblige. Um, I realize that sometimes 
our public comments going to have a lot of people and and um, that might really extend the meeting. Um, however, this is, you know, a, a hot topic for us. Um, so I don't know, I'd be happy to make a motion or if someone, you know, disagrees with that. Um, but since it was asked of us and I, I personally don't have any problem with it. Um, if when we do public comment for um, CU South or flood mitigation or anything related, if we just um, put kind of a flat, that public comment, each person can have their three minutes. And isn't that something that's really up to our chair given the rhythm and the size of our meeting? It, I could be. So if I'm bringing it up, then I guess right. I, and so I would agree with that. Call. Yeah, so, <laughs> so there's your and... hearing. what do you think? <laughs> well, obviously I made the two minute decision based on the volume of comments and the need to address the agenda that had been published for the meeting. So it will be, um, you feel better having it, whether it might be two minutes or three minutes, and it'll just vary depending on what's happening at the meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what's what's been published, what's been publicly advertised as the agenda for the meeting? Okay, that's fine. I just heard the community members say that that more time would be appreciated, so I just wanted to um, kind of speak for that. Yeah, then, I heard that. I heard that too, Caroline. And my only comment is. Um, additional written input is always welcome and read by, I know me and I think all board members. So that's another option. That's a great point. And, and Karen, um, Karen, it might be good to remind the public that you welcome comments at any of your meetings at any time on any topic. So right. you're more than welcome to come back next month or the month after that. Um, we've been going for over three hours now, Karen. I'm wondering if uh, you want to give people a break for a few minutes or something? Okay, I have uh, three more questions that I want to ask. So um, if we want to break now for a quick 10 minute break and come right back, uh, before, we can. Before we do, could I speak to Caroline's question about the 30% just while it's fresh on our minds? It'll take sure. less than 30 seconds. Um, I, I, I think this is our intent is that this is the presentation on the 30%. There really isn't additional detail that we would come back with. The, the questions and the requests for additional information largely tonight were things that will be answered at additional phases. Brandon did mention that we're, we're giving some comments back to the consultants. I will check with him if there's anything substantive that would change the the nature of what we presented tonight we'd certainly follow up with the board but th this is the 30 percent presentation um and and i'm fine with the break right now too i have one statement to make but it can it can certainly wait till we come back so that's fine and karen i'd be happy with a five minute five instead of ten okay everybody okay with five see you in five minutes Here's my answer. So Karen, can you hear me? Yes. Whenever everyone is back on, um, if, if it's okay with you, I can make my last um, just a statement and then um, someone else can, can take the floor if that works for you. I still have three questions, so I don't think we're ready for statements yet. Okay, it's not, um, maybe statement's the wrong word, but but that's fine, you can do your three and I can do mine. Mine's not necessarily tied to anything. So I'm, I'm good with that. Okay. Okay, it looks like we're all back. Um, a couple more questions, Brandon, from the, the packet. Um, it said that uh, the Corps of Engineers would be providing jur a jurisdictional determination of waters of the US. Has that happened, yes or no? And if not, when do you expect it? Uh, yes, we got a jurisdictional determination from the Army Corps of Engineers. And it said? 
uh, there are waters of U.S. that will be impacted by the project. Okay, thanks. And then um, the December 2021 packet had uh, a map of five test pits on CU that had to do with soil consolidation. What did you learn from them? Uh, I have that. Let me just look at that packet. Oh, no, I don't have that. Um, I'll, I'll have to look. So if it's part of the phase two uh, geotechnical investigation, it was really for ma soil materials properties. So soil classification, soil strength, a lot of geotechnical properties for potential fill material uh, and borrow material. That's what we are conducting those test pits for. And, and you have results from them? Uh, yes. Okay. Thanks. And also in the December packet, um, figure six was a map that didn't have enough gradation to show depths higher than one foot. Um, and we discussed that back in December at the study session. And I understood that um, more would be coming and that we would get a revised version of that map. Is that, does that exist somewhere or is it still to come or where are we on that? Uh, I actually don't have the December packet up. This map oh. here. Yes, so that's our floodplain modeling. We have updated that as part of the 30% um, design. So that'll be in the 30% design report. Okay, so it'll be posted along with the other information. Yes. yes. Great. Okay. Um, and then um, a question that keeps coming up again and again, and I, I have no idea whether you can answer it yet or whether it's going to be forthcoming later. And if so, when? Um, and that is a revised cost and who pays? And I keep hearing many people opining about this, but I'd like to hear a straight answer from you. Yeah, I'll, I'll turn it over to Joe, I think, because okay. we, we have Joe, a process internally. On. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, revised costs or came in. Uh, towards the end of the information that came from our consultant, the staff is packaging it, and we'll be presenting that to RAB here in our June meeting as, as part of the capital improvement package, like, like what you had tonight before this item. So um, in just a few weeks here, that information will be in our RAB memo and will be publicly available. Great. And um, what is the source? to pay for those costs? Where does the money come from? The, it's a utility CIP project, so we're, we're paying for it. There are also, um, Brandon would know the numbers, but there are contributions from the Mile High Flood District as well. Yeah, yeah correct. Yeah, Mile High is a funding partner on the project as well, so there will be funds um, from them as well. And the funds that do not come from Mile High Flood District come from utility fees that uh, of water and sewer, or where? There, there are three different utilities that are three different funds. There's a water fund, there's a wastewater fund, and then there's a stormwater and flood fund. So we, we manage and, and I oversee the three utilities funds for this project would come from the stormwater and flood utility. All from that one fund? Yep. Utility Thanks. customers get a, get a bill for all three, but- Yes, I'm, I'm, I am I'm see it yeah. every month, right? Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Sure. And uh, when will we know the proportion of, of the cost that comes from the stormwater and flood fund and, and the portion that comes from Mile High Flood District? I, I, Brandon may have just said it and I was concentrating on something else, but I think it's a few million dollars um, that the Mile High Flood District provides and the balance would be from us, from utilities. 
and and every year mile high flood district um, does a CIP process similarly so they allocate funds um, that can be used for specific projects so over the last um, approximately three years we've done an IGA with them every year to allocate funds to this project and we are still scheduled in their CIP funding process to have more funds allocated uh, into the future as we get closer to construction so that um, exact number won't be known until we get closer to construction, but it's um, right about 2 million right now from Mile High Flood District. Great, thank you very, and that's 2 million a year or- two No, million. total, total, two. and that's matching funds to what the city contributes to projects. So that's how Mile High um, will fund CIP projects is whatever municipality or district they're um, supporting will need to match those funds. Thanks, that's helpful. Okay, uh, Caroline, you're next. I knew that was gonna happen as soon as I had to go grab something. Um, and, and I actually still need to, to run back. Um, does someone, I'm gonna let someone else say, say anything else real quick. And I'm so sorry I could hear, but I, I will be right back. So if someone else wants to take the floor, I'll, I'll um, give up my turn and, and take it again in just a minute. Okay, I think we're really near the end here. So um, either Brandon or John or Joe, um, we've heard comments about ne the next time you'll be here. Can we get a clear idea about what the upcoming schedule is in whether, whether you anticipate coming back to OSBT in 2022 or whether your next appearance will be in 2023 or what's your best guess at this point? I, I and think I'm, I'm specifically interested in, in the kind of, of uh, restoration and flood mitigation things that we've been hearing about tonight that are especially important to OSBT. I, I can start, John, John and Brandon may wanna way in, but we've been talking as a team, Dan, John, Brandon, Chris, and I, and, and I think somewhere in the October or November timeframe, we would have the information from our consultants on the, on the OSO and the mitigation plan and work there. That would be our next touch point with the board. So, so right now we are forecasting coming back later in 2022. And then um, I don't recall exactly where on in 2023, but the 60% we would have a, a early 2023, we would have a similar discussion to this on the 60%. And then again at 90. And uh, on the open space side, we'll just have to also look at the other business that the board will have and what, what if and when we can fit that in. Okay. Brandon, did you have anything you wanted to add? Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Caroline? Yep. So um, uh, thank you for your patience. Um, so the only other thing that I wanted to make a comment on related to public comment tonight, um, and hopefully I, I say this right and, and touch on all parties. Um, you know, sometimes we have a lot of comments that are um, for flood mitigation. And sometimes we have a lot of comments that are not for flood mitigation. Either way, I think that I could speak for, you know, all the board members when we say the public com and staff, um, you know, that public comment is valuable and we really appreciate people that take the time to, to come and give their opinion. Um, I think whether they are a community member or a community member with a specific expertise or a community member that lives in the floodplain or um, a myriad of, of situations that it might be, I would just like to make sure that we're all being really thoughtful um, and not saying anything that perhaps could make anyone in the community uncomfortable to, to come and speak or, or make them feel um, that if they are or are not a member of an advocacy group, or again, if they just happen to to live um, somewhere where, where this, you know, obviously personally affects them. 
um, I heard uh, something that, you know, if, if there was a community member that made a comment, um, it, perhaps take it with a grain of salt, depending on if they're with an advocacy group for or against um, the flood protection. And I just don't want anyone to feel that if they are giving expertise or knowledge in any particular area that they may have, whether they are for or against it, that they should not come and speak or give their opinion because they they have or, or don't have a side. Um, for for whomever this was, I, I don't know if, if they belong to any advocacy groups, but I would just like for us to be thoughtful if if we bring that up that that I don't I don't feel that that necessarily would do anything to to their opinion. Um, and and I just want everyone to know, and again, I'm speaking for you know staff and the board, but I, I think that we all think that it's extremely valuable that the community cares and and wants to be involved with this. Um, so I would just encourage all of us to to kind of um, think about that as we move forward and and hopefully in in keeping aligned with that lessen any controversies or conflict that yeah. could happen down the road. So thank you for listening to that spiel and, and that's it for that. Thank you, Caroline. Um, and I wanna thank both board members and the members of the public who have participated in tonight's meeting because I am uh, delighted to see that we've been able to uh, get through most of the agenda so far and not be too far off on time. Um, we still have three different uh, agenda items to address and we'll keep going, but it looks like we're going to be able to, to get through our agenda for the evening and the time committed. And I, I appreciate not only the public comment tonight, but the people who have written prior to the meeting and shared their perspectives with us so that we could read those before the meeting began. Um, so John, do you wanna go ahead with uh, verbal updates from the director's office? Yeah, I just wanna um, also mention Karen, our gratitude to the utility staff for, for coming tonight and, and making that presentation and um, answering all, of your, all the questions and, uh, we really appreciate our partnership with 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 utility staff, and they they really have been going overboard in trying to work through all of the issues that the board has raised at their meeting in December. And you know we're we're trying to do the best we can. So really appreciate that, Joe and Brandon and Chris. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Um, for direct, so moving on to uh, director verbal updates. The the only update uh, that. Dan asked me to pass along to the board tonight is the announcement of two significant staffing changes and actually our opportunity to say farewell and thank you to two staff members who are leaving service and will be sorely missed by the department. Uh, first, Ranger Supervisor Rick Hatfield will be retiring later this month. Rick, as many of you know, has a long history with OSMP. Uh, he's been on staff for 24 years and a couple of years volunteering uh, for the department even before that. Uh, Rick really stands out for his dedication and leadership across the department. And one of the great impacts he will be long remembered for was um, de his development of a, a very strong and innovative relationship with the Flatirons Climbing Council and really being a primary champion for OSMP's volunteer Raptor monitoring program. Uh, Rick has been a pleasure to work with for many of us and OSMP wishes him well in his retirement. Our other announcement is that Mark Davison has decided to transfer over to the Parks and Recreation Department where he will be their senior planning manager. Uh, and while this is a significant loss for, to OSMP, uh, we, we're thrilled for Mark um, and thrilled that he will still be with the city of Boulder 
and helping Parks and Rec with planning, design, project management, and managing their CIP. Uh, this is a tremendous opportunity for Mark and a great fit for him professionally. Mark was at OSMP for the past six and a half years and had some major accomplishments, not least of which was delivering in a big way on the first OSMP master plan, which will be guiding our department for years to come. He is a thoughtful and dedicated leader and a highly valued colleague and sounding board for many within the department, from his peers on the director's team to the staff in his division and really uh, across all the divisions. Mark will be greatly missed at OSMP and I wanna thank him on behalf of the department for everything he has contributed over the years and to wish him all the best in his new role for the city. So that with that, that news, um, it pretty much wraps it up for the department and I'll hand things back over to you, Karen. Thanks, John. Um, and all the best to you, Mark, in Parks and Rec. I know, Mark, are you sure you just don't want two jobs? Don't, you don't want to do both OSMP and Parks and Rec? <laughs> You're on mute, so we can You're on mute. Okay, yeah, no, I know, thank you. Um, actually, if I could just say a few words, John, is that all right? Yeah, just, well, first off, I, I, yeah, exactly, Caroline. I like to say, I'm just, I've been telling everyone I'm hopping the fence, I'm not leaving. <laughs> yeah. Two people have said I'm going over to the dark side, which I thought was quite funny. <laughs> but, uh, we've got good relations now, but it, it is, it, I, I, I wanted to continue serving the city. I love Boulder, I love the people, the community, the staff the boards, council, you name it. It's it's such an honor to serve. So I feel very lucky. Um, I do want to thank the staff at OSMP. They've been so good to me over the years. Uh, I've learned so much from everybody in the department. And everyone knows this. It's incredibly professional staff, really thoughtful and super passionate. You can't ask for more than that. I actually wanted to thank you, the board, because I've worked, I guess, Tom Isaacson to begin with and a few others and now yourselves and you know this you give up your time as volunteers to do this and you are also so passionate professional and advocates for the department and it's something as staff i don't sometimes wonder if the board totally understands how much the staff appreciate the support of the board and what it means to work with you and to get good projects done like the master plan so that's a thank you to all of you over the years for what great collaborators and friends you've been and yeah, it is a bit bittersweet. <laughs> I am um, sad to be leaving, but I'm also excited, as John said, by the opportunity. There's some really good projects coming up. And the good news is I'll still be collaborating on a bunch of things like equity and youth and a few other projects. And then uh, finally, I do want to mention something about Rick. If Burton was here tonight, he'd laugh because Burton would say whenever he, me and him had a problem, and there was quite a few we had working in the ranger work group to figure out all those pesky visitors and you know animals going over fences and things <laughs> was um basically whenever we got stuck we turned to rick and rick would have already thought of the answer and i think that's what the department will miss his institutional knowledge and his incredible brains i just want to acknowledge rick as well tonight thanks john and thank you both. Thanks, Mark. we'll miss the both of you thank you so much for all of your time and service and and we'll be here if you ever want to come back <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I want to say a couple of thanks to Mark. It's been a pleasure to work with you in just my my year here. Um, and uh, I mean, you've uh, provided so much great um, experience to OSMP. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's kind of interesting because we have sort of this draft trade. I'm not a sports person, but like trade going on <laughs> and we got we got Jeff, but we're giving you up. I'm, I'm sorry, Jeff, but we like you, but we're going to miss you, Mark. Um, <laughs> you know, and then Jared going to the department, uh, to the um, county. And I, I'm just glad that, um, you know, you're not retiring, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that you're all too young to retire and our community is still going to be able to benefit from your experience. Um, and, you know, the Parks and Rec is going to benefit from your accent, and we're going to be missing that, too. So. <laughs> you know, I I'll still have to call you up every once in a while, if that's okay, Mark. I'm so no, glad good. you said that, because I didn't want to say it, but it's so true. It's just the, the nicest, <laughs> most calming voice, like, ever, right? <laughs> Someone once told me at the National Park Service, they said, you've got a nice accent and a couple of jokes. What else you got? And I said, you've been right through me. That's it. <laughs>
<laughs> but no, thanks, Michelle. Actually, it's nice when you think of Jared, Jeff, myself, all this, you know, us moving around. It's actually helpful for collaboration. John would be an attest to that. It's, you know, we're all professionals serving the community and the land. And it's basically, um, it just makes us all better collaborators. Yeah. So thank you. I got to give Jeff a hard time because I knew him back from Parks and Rec. So <laughs> exactly. He's following me. Yeah, I appreciate that, Michelle. <laughs> Okay, so we Thank have you. a few more matters from the board um, before everybody uh, gets off of here. Um, the first item was uh, reflections on our recent OSBT field trip. I realized that Caroline and Michelle were not able to go. Uh, John and Dave and I all really appreciated it. And in various configurations at the end of the field trip, we were talking about um, a second field trip for the other, I guess it's the other half of the Prairie Dog um, and Enhanced Ag Lands project. Um, we went to the northern acreage where there's been Prairie Dog removal and uh, enhancement of the fields up there where prairie dogs had lived. And the question is whether um, the board is interested in having a field trip to the southern grasslands where the, the receiving areas for those prairie dogs are, and whether um, you're interested in seeing the, the nest boxes, I think they're called, um, that are installed to receive the prairie dogs and the kind of, of acreage and habitat where the receiving sites are located. Uh, John and Dave, do you have anything else that you'd like to say about that topic? Uh, I will simply say that I think it's really important yeah, to, to see uh, how the relocations are going, what the sites uh, look like so that we've got a full picture of that, that whole process. So I would encourage staff and ourselves to get out in the field fairly soon and uh, kind of see the rest of the story. Yeah, uh, I thought the field trip was very uh, educational. I really enjoyed it, like getting out there, seeing the farmland. I, I learned a ton that I, I didn't know before. Um, uh, about uh, the farmland that uh, OSMP manages and prairie dogs as well. Um, you know, so I I would be happy to take any opportunity to get out there and, you know, view, uh, view the open space land, um, you know, uh, whenever there's an opportunity. So I would be willing to participate. And Caroline and Michelle, I, I know that there were complicating factors for both of you, which kept you from participating, but if you could just indicate whether you are interested in future field trips. Okay. Yeah, I, I would love to, that would be great. great. Okay, well, we'll, we'll pre proceed to work on that. Um, the other item has to do with the second written information in tonight's packet. It has to do with the June 23rd Joint Advisory Board meeting that um, was mentioned during public comment. And uh, my question is, John, do you have any more specifics about it? Because I think the, the written information in the packet is outdated. It's talking about having dinner together. And I think that's not in the cards at this point. Is that right? That's correct, Karen. Um, all of our engagements will, or all of our meetings will be Perfect. online until the level, um, the levels change again, which will be at least two weeks out. So it would be beyond this meeting. Okay, so we need to plan on a Zoom meeting and we'll get the URL link at some point between now and the 23rd. That's correct. Um, and, uh, do all the board members have that on your calendars and will you be able to participate? John, I have a question about the meeting. Um, is there a reason why the Water Resources Advisory Board was not invited to participate? Um, 
I'm don't I, not no reason that I know of, Dave. Um, other than maybe that I don't know if they were asked and are focused more on just the water utility projects and their CIP, which is their traditional um, focus. But uh, I can uh, inquire into that and and let you know. Because, in my opinion, uh, water is probably one of the uh, key. Uh, concerns, I was going to say key resources, but key concerns for this part of the country as far as climate change is concerned. And it just strikes me that looking at the information that we've gotten, we're taking a really mesic, you know, kind of a, a more well-watered uh, part of the country to, to try to emulate. And I'm very concerned that you know, that we're not paying attention to what is the key element for all of us, and, and that is, is there sufficient water? Yeah, I was asked earlier this week by a member of the Colorado Native Plant Society who contacted me and said, why are we planting more trees? We shouldn't be doing that in town. Right. That is the excellent example of, uh, you know, tree canopies in a semi-arid environment probably is... Uh, uh, antithetical. So we'll have a good conversation, I'm sure. <laughs> I will commit to look into that, Dave. And if there's, uh, it makes sense to extend further invitation. I'll, um, I'll request that for you if you want, if the, if the board wants. So. Yeah. I think that'd be good. Um, and uh, for your information, the rest of you on the board, um, because of our priority for council at the January retreat, the council's January retreat, one of our top priorities that we conveyed to council was OSMP's work on carbon sequestration. So I've asked John to um, brief this multi-board group on what OSMP is doing about carbon se sequestration because it's so relevant to the climate change topic of the joint advisory board meeting. So that will be happening also on the agenda. Uh, and the last comment I wanna make is that uh, I believe there's consensus on the board that in future agendas, we will allocate up to 15 minutes uh, at the end of each board meeting for questions and discussion of written information that's included in the packet so that we have time on the agenda to do that rather than to just have the written information and no comments and no further follow-up. Um, so in future packets, as you read the written information, if you have questions, be sure to jot them down so that during the matters from the board segment, we can, uh, ask and get those answered and discuss them. And as you've been um, coordinating with Dan, Karen in the past, uh, having those questions beforehand is very helpful for us to know who should, who on staff should be around late at, late at night at a meeting and should be uh, held over, whether it's something that deputy director could, could answer or, or whatnot. So um, just really helpful to have, have those lines of communication ongoing. Thanks, John. Good Will point. that be dedicated for um, items that are written um, or like the whole ocean? Because if it's for the written, then you kind of would know that what might those those staff members be. But I, I get what you're saying is if, if, it, if you, yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, any other comments or questions from anybody before we close the meeting? Okay, thank you everybody. And I, again, I appreciate everybody's cooperation in enabling us getting through this uh, substantive agenda this evening um, at, at close to the times that were posted on the agenda. And thanks again to you, Dave, for uh, orchestrating the whole uh, commendation to Tim Hogan and his contributions to OSMP. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thanks everyone. Good night. Good night.